Be your feminine self first and you'll be able to attract the man that you can continue to be feminine with or that mm -hmm. will honor, respect, and value your feminine energy. But what's happening to so many women is if a woman really wants to attract the right healthy man, someone that is safe in terms of they can trust, but um, where they have to fully, they have to feel a little vulnerable to really dive in and they really care about this man in a big way. What does a woman need to do in order to attract that ideal partner for themselves? And it's the same answer for the women in reverse. It's walking in their true, feminine, confident self, whoever they really are, but being that best version of themselves. And, and to what you were saying, it can't be find a man who you can be feminine with. It has to be be your feminine self first and you'll be able to attract the man that you can continue to be feminine with or that mm -hmm. will honor, respect, and value your feminine energy and protect your feminine energy. That's what you want. But what's happening to so many women is they become detached from their femininity or they're viewing it in a negative way. They're viewing it as weakness, as when I'm feminine, I get played, I get taken advantage of. And so the, the mindset is, if I find the right man, I can be that. So you hear a lot of women say, well, wow. I am feminine in a relationship. The problem is he can't see that far in to know wow. that he wants to get in a relationship with you. If he, you can spot it quickly, it's like a it's a quick essence of yes. seeing either a man or a woman if they're in that yes. masculine or feminine energy, right? You yes. can see it how they walk, how they talk, how they look at you, you know, how they carry themselves. Yes, you can feel it in a few seconds, probably. Yes. So if you're guarded and you're not allowing yourself to flow in that energy someone's gonna see that and they're gonna be, you know, not as attracted to you. You're yes. gonna be repelling. And, and what's gonna happen is, and I'm sure you can vouch to this, once a person heals, spotting, hurt, oh. dysfunction, trauma, it's like, it's easy now. It's like, it's like your eyes were so, are now so wide open. Crazy. You know, when, when we're not healed, we, we make excuses Man, for it. Yeah. <laughs> we, I've we been see... there many times in the past. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is if you're still guarded, the reality is you're guarded because you're holding on to hurt that you have not resolved. You're yes. holding on to fear due to past experiences. Well, healthy men can see there's something wrong and like, oh, I'm yeah, not going to go down that path. Yeah, this is, I'm good with this. Yeah. It's interesting because I've learned a lot in the past, I don't know, four years from different relationships, from you know breakups and healing. And I really took your lesson to heart after, I think the first time we interviewed, I interviewed you, where you were like, step one is heal, right? Mm -hmm. This is the, the healing journey. I didn't do that in a previous relationship. <laughs> I stepped into another one without healing, and then I was just like, I can never do this again. Mm -hmm. Because I thought entering a new relationship with a different person would create different results, and that wasn't the case. Because I still hadn't healed. Exactly. So it wasn't until I spent you know, six intensive months of therapy, coaching, and doing the internal work where I was able to start healing wounds. And it's a journey, yeah, you know, it's not like you're healed after one you know, day or something, but it's mm -hmm. been a continuous journey. I was able to spot it. And more importantly, I was able to be so courageously honest mm -hmm. with who I am, what I want, the vision for my life and a vision for a relationship, my values, what are non-negotiables for me. Mm -hmm. And I was so clear to let go of any potential relationship that didn't fit within a vision that I had. I was so happy to be a single for years mm -hmm. and create peace within, then enter something where I had to compromise uh, constantly compromise. Now mm -hmm. I'm all for alignment yes. and agreements where there's, maybe I don't get 100% of everything I want every moment, but we have a shared agreements and alignments yes. on our values, our vision and our lifestyle, right? It's like, and, and, and speaking about it early in, in a dating experience, for me was the shift. Mm -hmm. Saying, hey listen, uh, tell me if you th what you think about this concept. I love your concept of healing first before entering a new relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And something I did in the current relationship is I was like, we're not gonna have sex until we're committed, until we actually get clear on all these other things that I wanna talk about. Mm -hmm. Challenge is I never had the courage to talk about these things 
early enough in a dating experience about values, vision, lifestyle, you know, all these things, my priorities in life. Mm -hmm. But this time I did. And I think it gave me a lot more peace being able to speak my mind without clouded sexual confusion. Yeah. And I think a lot of people jump into sexual chemistry and acts of sexual interaction too soon before having the vulnerable conversations. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? And do you like that idea of waiting for a period of time until some type of a commitment? I'm not saying until marriage, but at least yeah. at least having these kind of conversations first. No, absolutely. I think if more people could wait, it would make things a lot better. Right. Um, as you said, not only not only are we afraid to ask certain questions and discuss certain things, but it's like we don't want to face the possible reality of this situation, so we keep everything on the surface. Uh -huh. We keep it at the sex. We Gosh. keep it at hanging out here and having fun. And yeah, we, we get along with each other's friends and blah, blah, blah. And that's great, but we're not diving deeper. And it's because... I think deep inside, we may know that once we do, this may not work anymore. And we, uh, and so we don't want to have to face that. We don't want to have to let go. So we keep kicking the can down the road. So I definitely think by removing, the, the more we can remove any distractions that impair judgment, the better. So sex is something that can definitely impair judgment. I, I'll give you another example. I knew this one guy, he went on a couple of dates and the first date I think was a concert and the second date was other, some kind of other festivity. And I said, listen, don't ever take a woman on, on a, to a concert on the first date. Because here's the thing. One, there's a huge distraction, the concert going on. It's not really an opportunity for you two to dive into each other. Two, even if you guys don't really mesh well, if you have fun at the concert oh, because cool. yeah. you guys <laughs> love that artist and you love that atmosphere... Well, that's clouding your judgment to seeing, but we don't really like hanging out with each other like that. See, hanging out with each other in fun environments that we already enjoy, that doesn't qualify mm -hmm. it. It's can we sit in a room with nothing going on, just talk and actually enjoy each other's presence. Mm -hmm. That tells us if we really like each other. Yeah. So I definitely think um, it's best to wait as long as possible. And as far as why people do it, I mean, one, people are just horny. That's, yeah. what, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> if true. We're going to keep it real. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. I think also, again, for some, so okay, for some women, and this is just some women, the idea is if I sleep with him and I put it on him, he'll like me. I, I'll, I'll get what I want out this guy. So it's a weapon for her. Right. For some guys, some of it is just desire, but some of it also is, I want to make sure she actually is attracted to me because a lot of men have dated women, waited, only to find out that she had sex with someone else during that process, or only to find out she was never really that interested. He feels used. So his way, some guy's way of trying to confirm that you actually have genuine interest is through intimacy. Mm -hmm. You see, so some will rush to that as a, a form of validation for themselves. Right. Um, but I, and I think just also again, people sometimes get caught up in the moment, and I hate when people say, "Oh, well, there was this great sexual chemistry." Chemistry cannot occur until you guys actually have sex. So what you felt was attraction and horniness at the same time, and it created this energy between y'all, and you want to move forward with that. And so again, you just have to be careful. Now, I, I think it doesn't mean every person who's had sex too soon is doomed. There are people who've gotten married after having sex on the first date. Um, you know, some people are able to pull back and still properly evaluate, but individuals have to be honest with themselves about how does this impact my ability to see if this is the right person for me yes. and for me to show up as my authentic self in this relationship. What do you think would be three things that every, every woman should either do or not do before they get into a committed relationship not even talking about marriage but just i'm gonna now i'm gonna be committed and we're gonna commit to each other what are three things they should or should not do before that okay or three conversations or whatever it might be i think one conversation that everyone needs to have is what do you see your role as in a relationship mm. and what do you see my role as let's discuss all the needs and desires i really I, I would argue 90% of people enter into a commitment not even knowing the full list 
of what this person wants and expects or is hoping for out of this. So roles and responsibilities yes. in a relationship. Is that in a dating relationship or in a marriage relationship? It could be boyfriend, whatever level we're trying to go to sure. next. So if right now we're trying to just be boyfriend and girlfriend, let's define that. I think defining it for marriage as well, if that's the ultimate the end next, goal, yeah. would be smart. Because what's the point of Spending doing two this years dating? Yeah, and then we find out yeah. we're on two different pages for marriage. But why that do people no not sense. have this roles conversation before they commit? I so What's popping in my head right now is a lot of people are ashamed to state what they want. Gosh. They, they feel like it's, they're not allowed. So, perfect example. There are some men out there and even some women who are sticklers when it comes to your physical appearance. Mm -hmm. All right? And they have <laughs> certain expectations as far as how they want you to look. But society, family, friends tells them, oh, that's shallow. Oh, you, if you love them, that shouldn't matter. So then people become hesitant to say, this is what I'm expecting. This is what I want. Also, because if at that point you already like this person, again, there's this fear of if I say what I really want, I may lose what I'm hoping to hold on to right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me just find a way to dance around this and, and hope we can discuss it later. I also think some people just don't truly know and understand themselves enough to articulate what it is that they need and desire in this nice. relationship. So too many people haven't spent time just really asking themselves, okay, what is important to me? Mm -hmm. What's gonna make me happy? And what, what is it that if it's not involved in this relationship is not going to allow me to show up 100%? So basically if, and I'm just using this as a random example, if you're a man and you value a woman who's cooking for you, and you say, all right, if she's not cooking, that's going to make you miserable to the point that you will no longer be showing up 100% for this relationship, then you should not sacrifice wow. a woman who can cook. Plain and simple. Whatever it is, if it's for a woman, you know, communication or going out often, certain lifestyles, mm. all these things need to be discussed. And I just think that people just, they hope for the best rather than face the reality of what may be going on right now. And I think, you know... Uh, I speak for myself too, but I think I know a lot of people lean too much on the sexual chemistry, right? Whether it be the, the, the desire, the feeling they have between each other or the actual act of sex that feels so good with the dopamine. You're just like, this feels so good to be with this person that they don't want to rock the boat and ask those questions yeah. or communicate. And here's what's crazy about that. For women, I can't tell you how many women have had sex with men the sex wasn't that great. <laughs> it was nothing special. But she likes him so much that she pushes past that. Really? Yes. Absolutely. How, how important is great sex for a relationship to last? In my opinion, it's extremely important. So consider what you just mentioned with the oxytocin. Mm -hmm. The oxytocin is released through orgasm. All right? So if you're not having sex that takes you to orgasm, you're not getting, at least from my knowledge, right. maybe I'm wrong, but you're not getting the full dose of oxytocin there. I also believe, like, I, I view oxytocin as like a God mechanism, meaning it was put there to help two people stay bonded Connect. together. Yeah. Yes. So if we are married or whatever, and we're having great sex consistently, we're going to be much more bonded to each other. If we're not having great sex... Mm -hmm. We don't have that bond anymore. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now it's so much easier for things to get in between. So I think that it's extremely important, but I will say that great is subjective and, you know, what level of quality that man or that woman needs is going to vary, but they have to have their needs mm -hmm. satisfied or else you're asking for trouble. So this this uh, conversation about needs mm -hmm. needs to happen before you get committed, right? <laughs> yeah. Needs, response, uh, roles, and how, how you're gonna play, how I'm gonna play a role in this, how you're gonna play a role in this. What would that conversation look like? You know, people have been together dating for a couple of months, they're thinking about getting connected. Should they say, hey, here are the three things I wanna talk about. You know, Stefan Speaks said that we gotta have these three conversations. One's about needs, one's about roles. What was the third thing? What do we say? I don't think, I don't we think mentioned you mentioned the third one. Yeah, 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 we didn't get to the third one yet. What would be the, the third one, the third the, conversation to have? Or, or The third conversation to have, oh man, I, I just think it's, 
It's about how we need to communicate when there is an issue. Mm. I think we lack having a structure of, of communication to where if there's an issue that needs to be resolved, we understand how we go about this. You know, when you're trying to fix things on the fly or handle things on the fly, you're, you're now at the mercy of your emotions and where that may take you in that moment. So by having something that we agreed upon, yes. okay, we take maybe 10 minutes off in our own corners, then we come back and we discuss this, or we write a letter, or, you know, some people have the rule, we don't go to sleep mad at each other. Having those structures in place, because the communication, without healthy communication, the relationship's not going to last, and it's not going to be successful. So it's important to have something laid out so we know how to go about this. Yes. You know, I'm a huge fan in writing letters, even when it comes to discussing deep issues, so maybe implementing that in the process, but once we can agree to a structure and agree to we will always make time to sit down and talk about these things, as well as adding constructive criticism. So I think I mentioned this to you before, like I believe in relationship checkups. So that's another part of the structure where maybe we agree every three months or six months, whatever it is, maybe once a month, where we have a time where we sit down and we go over, all right, what, what anything, every, what's good here? What needs to be improved? What aren't you happy with? Let's consistently, constructively criticize so we are aware because what happens in so many relationships is that, let's say you're not happy about something, but you guys never make time to talk about it. So now it lingers. And in that lingering, now you're catching an attitude. Now they're mad at you, but they don't understand that at the root of it is this issue that was never expressed. Mm -hmm. So now they feel like you're being stupid or you're acting crazy or whatever. Now that turns into a lack of intimacy because if she's feeling some type of way emotionally, she's not going to be sexually receptive to her, man. Right. Now that turns into more resentment. And you see, it just dominoes and it just gets worse and worse. So we have to establish communication structure I, early as possible. I love that. You know, something that... Uh, Martha and myself started to do before we got into a commitment I said listen the only way you know this works for me one of my needs is that we enter the relationship in some type of therapeutic coaching experience mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a therapist it doesn't be, you know whatever we want to do we need a third party that we can sit with once every couple of months and talk about agreements and just making sure we're staying on track with what we yeah. want in the relationship that's something that I always wanted but never created. Mm. <clears throat> and I said, listen, this is the only way this will work for me, is creating that, making sure that need is met. Yeah. She was like, I'm down. And what that did for us was it allowed us early on to create an agreement about how to communicate when things were uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? And one of the, our, the agreements was like, listen, I'm never going to yell or raise my voice, but... I can't have someone else in my space doing the same thing. Like if you scream and you yell because you can't manage your emotions, that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And if you want to yell at another person, then cool, but that's not going to be me. Yeah. And so we created that agreement, right? And there hasn't mm -hmm. been yelling. There's been uncomfortable conversations, mm -hmm. but we have agreements on how to communicate with each other so it doesn't escalate. Exactly. And it's been a beautiful practice because we both have an agreement and there's a third party that witnessed the agreement, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, no, I never said this. Yeah. <laughs> people do it all the time. Yeah. You create something you talk about when you're all loving and kind, but then a year later, like, I never said I'd do these things, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's really, for me, it's been really helpful to just over communicate in some ways and be like, these are what I need. This is what I want. And are you in alignment with this? Yes. That's been really powerful. So this masculine and feminine energy is something that you say has been, um, you know, people have been confused about lately, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Why are people confused about understanding and stepping into their masculine or feminine energy? So it's, I'm trying to find the right way to say this, but I'm just going to say it. Society has been pushing for equality so hard that they're now causing a, a lack of balance between men and women. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm all for equality in certain areas, right? But I think we have to recognize we are two different types of people. We are wired differently. If we would come into understanding of our differences, we can create more harmony. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be like each other. So here's one perfect example of how I feel like it's throwing things off a lot, <clears throat> going back to the sex. So you'll have this push where people are saying, well, women are just like men when it comes to sex. I even one time, many years ago, I won't say the name of the company, but I was brought to a dating app company 
and it was me and a few other people and they had this presentation and they had the scientists that said there was a study that shows women want sex as much as men. And I disputed it. Mm -hmm. I was like, no. <laughs> I said, I think what that study is not taking into account is that you guys are combining intimacy with sex. Women want intimacy. And unfortunately for most women, they feel like they can't get the intimacy unless they go through sex to get it. All right, so just getting a guy to just cuddle with you and touch without it trying to escalate to sex, that's hard for a lot of women. They don't experience that. You, you talk to a lot of married women, they'll say, the only time my husband wants to touch me is when he wants to have sex. Mm. So going back to this, pushing that men and women are the same, so look at it like this. If you're telling men that women are just like us, that, one, that man now feels like there's no need for foreplay. Mm. There's no need for connection outside the bedroom. There's no need to make sure she's there emotionally or mentally because we don't need that, <laughs> all right? When we're ready to go, we're ready to go. It could be World War III outside. We're right. still ready to go. <laughs> but that woman, if she is consumed mentally, that's going to hinder her ability to show up sexually. If she's stressed out. If she's stressed out, if there's too much going on, if she doesn't feel comfortable and safe in that relationship. Again, the connection outside the bedroom affects the connection inside the bedroom. She needs a little bit more as far as foreplay. And again, is this every last woman? No, but typically this is the case. So by fighting for equality, you're limiting people's ability to have sexual harmony. All right. Mm. But if we accept it, OK, these are the differences. This is what I have to do as a man to create a more sexually receptive environment. Well, things everybody wins. What, everybody a, what wins. does a man need to do to create a more sexually receptive environment? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think the, the first thing is the connection outside the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Again, so here's as we said earlier, women want to feel safe. They want to feel secure. If you can but if they go after the safe guy. They Remember that, that? Yeah, they're different. They go yes. to the safe guy. That's just a guy who they don't have to be too vulnerable with. Yes. But we're talking about creating safety where she can give you all of her love, all of her heart, but she can rest a little, a little easy that you it's in good hands, all right? That you have good intentions, that you're not judging her. That's, that's one of the big things. You want to let a woman feel more sexually receptive, you can't make her feel judged. You know what I'm saying? The minute she feels like you're judging her, you're going to look at her some kind of way, you make it harder for her to open up to you in that area. What about when a woman judges the man or makes him wrong or he's not enough? I think, well, I, I say this. I think it, it, will comp it will hurt him in his ability to show up emotionally for her. It doesn't have the same negative impact on him sexually. Can it? Yes, but not as common as it will for a woman. All right? Most men, even though they're feeling some kind of way, they're going to still show up to the bedroom, no problem. But opening up emotionally becomes harder. So that's why a lot of men struggle speaking to their woman and letting her in uh, into his life even deeper because of the fear of she won't respect me if I tell her how I'm really feeling. Wow. She'll look at me different. So that's, and again, it highlights the differences of how these actions impact us and the environments they create in our relationship. So I think that we've got to get back to understanding the difference between men and women, the balance of the masculine and feminine, and why that is so important to the success of a relationship. How do people start to buy into that again and believe in that and start to shift the way? Because it's like telling people to completely shift who they are, how they've been acting. Mm -hmm. In order to buy into that, believe it, and not get hurt by stepping into that. Yes. I think step one is asking yourself, what kind of life do you want to live? Yeah. Because a lot of people's struggle with getting in tune with their energy is due to letting outside noise tell them how they should live, what should be acceptable. So for example, if you're a woman and you want to walk in your feminine, and let's just say not even just walk in your feminine, let's just say you're a woman and your heart is in having a family, being at home, doing these things. But society is telling you, you can't do that, that's weak. You, you can't rely on a man, all these things. Well, it pushes her away from where her heart really wants to be. And now she's at conflict with herself. And how can you create that life that you desire if you're at conflict with yourself? Mm. It's the same thing for a man. If you as a man want a woman who can be feminine to you and have a certain lifestyle in the household, but you're letting society tell you, no, 50-50 and all these things, well, you, you can't do that. Like at that point, you're compromising what you really want, who you really are, and that takes you away from achieving what you're trying to achieve. 
So each individual has to sit and ask themselves, okay, what kind of life do I really want to live? And what kind of life would I want to live if there was no fear of getting hurt? Ooh, or fear of judgment. Exactly. Or, yeah. Because now, if if the if because I, I tell you this, if if most women, like the topic of being submissive is a hot topic for a lot of women. A lot of women don't like that word. But I always argue that if you sat down with a bunch of women and say, listen, if an angel can come from the sky and say, I will give you the most amazing man. He will tap into all you need. He will make sure you are protected, never cheat on you. All you need to do is be submissive to him. 90% of women will sign up right away. Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose, and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset, and I think you're gonna love this. Through powerful stories, science-backed strategies, and step-by-step -step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. Chemistry can be created. All right. And again, so using the whole uh, basketball analogy, uh -huh. a team comes together, you can build chemistry. We can learn how to work together. We can learn how to coexist, yeah. so to speak. But that doesn't mean we really like each other at its <laughs> core. All right. Yeah, yeah. There's the difference. So you can have a team where the players learn to play together, but they still hate each other. All right. So they had chemistry. But no connection. But not connection. Exactly. When you have a connection in a relationship, that, that is way more important than chemistry because the, the connection will bring the chemistry. We don't got to worry about the chemistry part. When two people have a connection, it's they electric. learn. It's exactly. like, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's a rare thing. Again, we don't experience that with everybody. It's something that happens. You, it's rare to find someone who can say they've had that deep, genuine connection more than two times in their life. Mm. If even twice, all right? It's usually once, <laughs> to be wow. honest with you. Wow. But I'm going to give it two times. And yes, there are going to be some people out there that say, well, there's billions of people in this world. Why could It's not about, yes, is it technically possible? Maybe so, but you're not going to come across billions of people mm. in the world. You're only going to come across a certain amount of individuals. And in that group of people, yes, you're only going to find that connection maybe once or twice. And once you get there, like once somebody sets the bar that high in your life, it is very hard. <laughs> to go, yeah, you have to refine that. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to feel comfortable anymore going beneath that. If you do, you're going to find yourself not at peace and very miserable in your relationship. Wow. Connection, balance. Is there anything else or is those are really the main two things and then everything else is figure out? I would, the, the last thing I'm going to throw in is attraction. And the reason I throw it in is because I feel like in this world, we we try to shame people for putting a focus on attraction. And to me, it, it's not about looks. Looks is about specifically saying you have to look like this, you have to be this tall, you have to have this body shape. I'm not saying looks, I'm saying attraction. We have to be physically drawn to each other. That's the last ingredient that takes a relationship from platonic to romantic. And that's the ingredient that if you remove it, will make a romantic relationship. Friends. Of the, exactly. Yeah. Friends, roommates. You got people living together. With no sexual chemistry. Exactly. Because why? The attraction is gone. But if you bring it back into that relationship, see how quickly things change. Wow. That is the ingredient. So we have to be willing to embrace the fact of, yes, attraction is necessary, one, when we first meet each other, and we need that to be more drawn to each other. But then to maintain and sustain that great relationship, we can't make excuses for letting ourselves go and, and understand there's a difference between aging and letting yourself go. A lot of people are letting themselves go, making excuses for it. Right. I understand life hits us. It's tougher as we get older. Yes, but you got to work to maintain yeah. attraction in your relationship. You let that go to the wayside. And friends. Exactly. How important is sex in a relationship? Hugely important. <laughs> <laughs> this is coming from a guy who's abstinent, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know what? To me, I, I say hugely important from the standpoint of, I think people have to look at sex not just from the stand, from the perspective of pleasure, but from the perspective of bonding. Mm. I believe it is an opportunity for two people to grow closer together. And when two people know how to truly satisfy each other, it creates an amazing bond. Deeper connection. Better balance. Exactly. More attraction. Yes. All and it of it. Keeps that. it going. Exactly. Because if you have two unsatisfied people sexually, you're gonna have a problem. You can't find a relationship where that exists 
and they're all happy and everything's great. It doesn't work that way. People crave intimacy. People crave that level of bonding with each other. And yes, biologically speaking, we can talk about the needs of a man and a woman and all these things, but I think even going deeper spiritually and all that, sex is important. Yeah. And we are not taking enough of a mature approach to understanding and learning sex. I think people are very much behind in their understanding of Especially it. Especially in America, it's like we weren't educated. Exactly. It's a very like hush hush type of thing it's not talked about in schools your parents at least most parents aren't talking about it mm -hmm. until it's like the moment and it's like let me say something to just get it out and then let them figure it out well and, right? and not just that a lot of our parents don't know either right like people just don't take time to get more educated on their bodies on sex on true sexual satisfaction there's a lot of lies going on i tell people all the time listen a lot of women aren't being sexually satisfied all right but they're lying to their friends. They're lying to their their partners. Right. So there's a perception that everything is all good. No, it's not. It, there's a huge disconnect between the reality or the perception of women's sexual satisfaction and the reality of women's sexual satisfaction. And that contributes to a disconnect in marriages. Because again, if the woman is not satisfied, she now becomes less willing to be uh, sexually involved with her husband. Mm. Now, he starts to gain resentment. He starts to feel neglected. Starts to wander. Exactly. Every snowballs from there. Mm. We can't overlook that and act like everything's going to be fine. And we can't say, well, you should love them enough to where it doesn't matter. Listen, <laughs> we're talking about maintaining a committed relationship. That's a part of it. Plain and simple. And we have to learn how to make it better on both sides and how to be more honest with each other. I think if we can learn to be more honest and transparent, then we can work on the things that are lacking. Wow. But people, again, they feel very uncomfortable speaking about sex, speaking about their needs and and constructively criticizing their partners. We have to learn how to do Because you don't want to hurt do someone, that. yeah. So exactly. How often should we be talking about our sexual needs in, a, in, a, in an intimate relationship? Should it be like once a month we sit down and like schedule it out? <laughs> is it like pillow talk every week? Like what should be, again, everyone's different, but what do you think is an appropriate amount of time? Yeah, I, I think it depends. I, so what jumps in my head, I would say every three months, if I had to put a number on uh -huh. it, all right? But I do think it depends on the couple. I think more so it's when an issue arises, talk about there it. There you go. The key is we have to create environments where we can have those talks. See, again, we're, we're laying the wrong foundations in our relationships to where we can't have these open discussions about sex and other things lacking in our relationship. And we're afraid to push our partners away. We're afraid to ruffle the feathers or rock the boat. But if you can't talk to them... We resent things, right? Exactly. And what happens is you hold it in, and now the, the negative energy comes out in other ways. And now they're confused because they're like, why are they giving me this attitude? And they're thinking, like I said earlier... He's thinking it's about the towel. No, it's not about the towel. <laughs> it's really about yeah. something else that you're not telling him. So we need to be more honest and transparent. And we need to create an environment where we can have this talk and you're not going to take it personally to the where you're going to internalize it or allow it to now throw our relationship off because you're getting upset and you're allowing it to, you know, have a negative impact. No, take it as, okay, that's how you feel. Cool. Let's work on this. Mm. How can we make this better? You know, we have to be serious about tending to the needs of our partner if we're going to have successful relationships. Yeah. There's so many uh, divorces happening. You know, it's higher than ever, right? Yeah. I think it's the... Uh, we had a divorce attorney on who's talking about how it's higher than ever. And there's also even more people who stay married who probably should be divorced, mm -hmm. who aren't happy. And so it sounds like there's a very small percentage of married people who've been together for many years who are actually still thriving in relationship. I'm just... Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's more, but it sounds like it, right? Uh huh. There's a very small percentage that are having like these incredible, long-lasting marriages and relationships that like mm -hmm. have the attraction and connection and balance and all these things. Why do you think that is, and how can we decrease the number of failed relationships? Or is that the wrong question to ask? No, I think it's a good question. I think well, one we have to understand: marriage is not the issue. It's marrying the wrong person and marrying for the wrong reasons, mm. all right? And then underlying to those things <clears throat> are, is the lack of healing. Because it's the lack of healing that leads us into these uh, wrong relationships and allows us to entertain situations we should not entertain. Mm. Because again, for example, if, if you're a guy or a woman, if you've been through some things and now you think 
you don't deserve that great person, that great relationship because your perception of yourself is low. Now you're going to just latch on to whoever comes around who says, I want to be with you and willing to give you what you want at that moment. Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, this is safe. This will work. Let me go ahead and go with it. But you're never truly into them like that. It's never going to be the relationship it needs to be. All right. But that all stemmed from your lack of self-worth because you didn't heal from whatever traumatized you emotionally before. So how do we heal first? What's that process look like? So it's a long process, and I do plan on, I have a book I'm working on right now called Finding Love After Heartbreak, Ooh. and it's going to lay out the entire process. But So I'll give a little bit right now, yeah. and I'll save the rest for later. Great. So one thing is first, we got to get the hurt out. And so I have this exercise I do at all my events called the Who Hurt Me List. Mm. And so you get a piece of paper. It could be like 100 hundred people me. like, oh, motherfucker. It happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ask yourself the question, who hurt me? And now every person who comes to mind, write them on that paper. Doesn't matter if you think you move past it. Doesn't matter if you think it's small and insignificant. If they came to mind when you asked yourself that question, put them on the Anyone paper. Anyone in your life. Anyone from a in child, your life. a friend, to your parents, to a, a lover. Anyone. Yeah. Anyone, anything. If they come to mind, put them on that list. Because that's how we start to recognize the pain points in your life. Now we see, okay, this is where it's coming from. A lot of people have suppressed what has happened to them. And so you can't, you can't address and resolve something that you're not willing to accept existing in your life. And the reality is that just because it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's still lingering within you. And it's causing a lot of problems. And it causes a lot of emotional stress, which then turns into physical ailments. And it just snowballs Tension, from there. Tension, anxiety, yeah. and it's all <clears> of that. Fear, yeah. all Depression. Yeah. All right. A lot of these things that we go through in, in mental health stems from things that we have not resolved from our past. All right? And it's just all contributing to the, the issues that we're ex experiencing mm -hmm. in the now. Right. And some of us, we may not be experiencing the issues right now, but we will. It's coming. <laughs> it's just festering in you, and it's going to come out at some point. Yeah. So write so, a list and and think about those moments and reflect on them? Or what's... Well, no. So at, at that <clears throat> point, once you get the list, now we can uh, see the first person. And, and I won't go too much further, but let's just say you're going to have to go through a process of getting things off your chest. We have not released these things from our spirit, from our system, and we need to essentially emotionally detox. And to do that, you've got to get it out. So whether you speak into a recorder, write a letter, something, and like, like I said, scream into a pillow, yeah. <laughs> anyway, right? Yeah, but I, but I do want like a full release. I'll, again, we don't fully release. Would right? you release each person or just everyone at one time? So I would say this: you want to start with, let's say, your top three. Now, I've had clients yeah, yeah. where they did their top three, and that kind of, once they got through those, they were able to process everyone differently to where it wasn't necessary to do everyone else, all right? Now, right. if you have 10 significant experiences and 10 significant different people that need to be addressed, yes, you may have to release with 10 different people. So it depends on the person. And that's why something like this requires a more in-depth process. We got to talk about things. We got to understand yeah. what about it did you internalize? how you're seeing it, because some of it is changing your mindset, changing your perception of what happened, understanding that it wasn't about you. Like we said earlier, hurt people hurt people. And so once you understand that and understand how they behave and why they behave the way they do, it changes how you look at things mm -hmm. and how you internalize those situations. So there's so much more we got to get right. into, but <clears throat> just getting at least that list started. Is a good well, at step. Yes, because now you at least get to see, okay, here's where it is. Here's what needs to be addressed. Now, let me get help to address these things and start the process of healing so that gotcha. I'm not ending up in more bad situations or bad relationships. Repeating the process. Exactly. <clears throat> Let's say you've dealt with the hurt and it takes, you know, it takes the time that it takes you and you've gone through all that. How do you manifest and attract a partner that you want to be with that has those three keys, the, the connection, the attraction, and the balance that you feel like is the one, could be one of the ones. Mm -hmm. How do you set yourself up to attract that incredible partner? So one, you got to be yourself. So finding yourself is number one. Mm. All right. You can't connect with someone if they're connecting with the fake you. Ooh. All right. Yeah. That's a false connection. So you have to discover who you are, become confident in that, stand strong in it. Now, who is drawn to that person, you know it's real. All right. And so that's where we begin. Two, you need to exude positive energy, all right? To me, and this is, I, I think this is very important for women, all right? Because 
the reality is that it's men or the type of men that a lot of women want aren't going to be drawn to a negative woman. No. There's millions of good women, but that doesn't mean they're positive women. All right, and it's that lack of positive energy that holds them back more than they realize. Really? Yes. And just why, like even just saying negative things throughout the day, they, they might be a good person, but if they're always complaining or ex- negative, or, exactly. And not even just what they say. Again, it's how they're coming off because their facial energy, energy, their body language. Yes, it's like so. Look at it like this. I, I tell people all the time: it's not what you say; it's how you make them feel. Mm-hmm. All right. So you can say all the wonderful things you want. But if in your presence they don't yeah. feel at ease, they don't feel peace, they don't feel that positivity, that's still gonna throw everything off. If you say nice things but you have a frown, <laughs> exactly. like, what's the point? Exactly. You know what I mean? yeah. Exactly. And what what a lot of women aren't realizing is that their energy is off because they have walls up. Mm. They're so scared. They're so uh, fixated on protecting themselves because of they've been hurt in the past. Exactly. Haven't healed from those things. But yeah. I tell people all the time. The same walls you have up to protect you are the same walls blocking your blessings, all right? So you don't realize you're restricting your ability to love and be loved because you're walking in fear, all right? You can't walk in fear and expect all these wonderful things to happen. It doesn't work that way. Even in business, the ones who succeed are the ones who put the fear aside and say, I'm going to have faith and push forward no matter what, no matter how it looks in front of me, no matter how many people tell me you're doing the wrong thing, get a regular job, whatever. No, you believe what you need to do and you push forward past that fear. It's the same thing with relationships. You have to push forward in faith, not fear, if you want to receive that great relationship. Mm. And so, yes, this can happen with men as well. I don't want men thinking they can carry around a bunch of negative energy and they're going to get a great relationship. But I do think it shoots women in the foot more because here's the other thing that people don't talk about a lot. And some people may not like this, but I'm just going to keep it real. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It pulls women away from their feminine energy. When they're not positive. When they're not positive. And when they're holding on to these fears and have these walls up. And it's the feminine energy that makes the woman so powerful. That is what, that's the tool that is at her disposal that Mm -hmm. can make the world her oyster, all right? But women have become very detached from their femininity. And the thing is this, if you, a lot of women will say they're not feminine. They're just not that way. I dispute that in most situations. No, you become detached from it. You become uncomfortable with it due to, again, a lack of healing and due to experiences in your life. Now, if you are more masculine, so to speak, and you are happy that way, then by all means, continue to live your life as you are. But if you're not seeing things work for the, the way that you want them to, and you're in that energy, that more masculine energy or more further away from your feminine, then consider making a switch. Consider mm-hmm. at least trying it. <clears throat> yeah. See the difference. And what I find with a lot of women is that not only is it beneficial to them as far as uh, relationships wise, it's beneficial in the quality of their life. But their health. Their health their peace, their work, you name it. I have a client, she's a a doctor at a big hospital. And when she came to me, she was frustrated with relationships, ready to give up on men. Nobody liked her at work. She was just a hard, tough manager. So we worked on her energy. We worked on healing. We got her energy. We got her to embrace more feminine energy. She will swear by it right now. In one month, her whole hospital started to love her. Now they're all helpful, whether they were women or men. Men started coming out the woodworks, all right? <laughs> Let me get your number, girl. Let yes. me get at you, girl. Yeah. She ended up meeting her soon-to-be fiancé on an airplane mm. two months after we started doing the coaching. So, What were the shifts that she made every single day? Like, what was the things that she said, okay, I'm going to not be this way. I'm going to start trying this. It was just, it was one, being more conscious of your energy. I think, number one, we have to be mindful of the energy we're giving off. We become so distracted by our issues that we're facing in the world, by our responsibilities. We're not always in tune with what we're giving off. So to give an example, and this is just a small one, even for me as a man, I work out a lot. When I come out the gym, I started to notice I'm very tense. Mm -hmm. My face is, you know, hard. Exactly. So I've learned to, when I walk out the gym, take a deep breath, relax the body, relax the muscles, and the energy completely changes, all right? Because yes, you can become very intimidating as a man, just like you can become very intimidating as a woman. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be mindful of, are you making yourself more approachable? Are you allowing uh, people to feel more comfortable being around you? And so that starts with being mindful of it, being conscious of it. And one great way to do that is, Get an accountability partner, mm-hmm. all right? Absolutely. Tell someone who 
who has the ability to be positive because you don't want to pick a negative person to be your accountability partner. It's right. going to throw everything <laughs> off. <laughs> but you pick a positive person and you say, hey, listen, whenever I'm being negative, whenever I'm giving that bad energy, let me know. Mm -hmm. Because now when they tell you, you won't, you won't always realize when you're doing it, at least not at first. But once they start calling you out, now you become more mindful of it. Now you can right. take hold of it and control it. And now you master what energy you're giving off at certain times. And that changes everything. Wow. When someone feels like they found the one, and I've heard mm -hmm. this a lot, like, I know this is the one, I, or I thought they were the one, and then it didn't end up working out. And they want to get married. They've decided marriage is for them. They want to be life partners. What are a few of the conversations that they should have to not know for certain, but know for better certain that this is the right decision. This partnership is the right decision to move forward in a long-term committed relationship. Okay. As opposed to just maybe the infatuation behind it or the mm -hmm. initial connection or the attraction. What are a few questions they should be asking each other that maybe they haven't asked yet to know whether or not they're setting themselves up for that successful long-term relationship? Okay. Number one, how do you envision your role in marriage? All right. People don't go in finding out what the expectations are mm. before they get married. They have this assumption that we're just going to transition from how we are in a relationship to being that way in the marriage. No, 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 no. <laughs> because a lot of times things change and, and the level of expectation raises now in marriage. Mm. You also have some people who may think, for example, you may have a man out there who thinks, Okay, my job is to court you when we're boyfriend and girlfriend. Or when we're married. When we're married, I don't got to do all that work anymore. Now I'm your husband. I've given you the ring. Satisfy me. Make me happy. You got to find that out. Because you're setting yourself up for failure if you don't realize he thinks he gets to take time off wow. now that he's married you. Or he may think, as long as I'm paying these bills, don't ask me for anything else. You got to find out. So wow. we need to ask, what do you so She perceive? should be asking that. Yeah, both so, of them should be yeah. asking. What? How do you perceive <clears throat> your role in marriage? What are your expectations from me in marriage? Let's find out what we need, what we're expecting from each other. Number two, w making sure our values are aligned. Mm -hmm. All right. So whether that be spiritual, whether that be even financial values, whatever those things are, let's make sure we're on the same page about it. And if we're not on the same page, are these things we can balance out and work out? All right. So for example, if let's look at it from a financial perspective. If I'm a very frugal man, yes, and this woman is a spender, <laughs> I have friends in this situation, and it's not good. Exactly, and I'm sure they didn't talk about it in advance. Uh -huh. You want to uh -huh. talk about these things and say, okay, how do we view this? What are your what are your expectations as a spender? Are you someone who thinks, well, I got to be able to spend some free money every yeah, month? Yeah. I got to go shopping every month. What is it? Let's come to an agreement beforehand that we're both comfortable with. But let's understand what we're walking into here. Yeah, yeah. All right? Yeah. Again, we don't talk about these things. We just assume, oh, because she's not asking for money now, she won't ask for money later. And that's not necessarily true. Right. Let's find out. What are we expecting? Do our values align in marriage? Um, I definitely think, number three, sexual expectations. I think that needs to be discussed and understood. Um and again, it's all about compromise if a compromise can be found. So it's not saying, okay, well, I expect it four times a week. Right. You know, he or she says two times a week, and now we're just going at it. No, well, then maybe we go with three times a week. Yeah, yeah. But we make sure the compromise is something that we can both be happy with. Don't, when you compromise on something that you're not going to be happy about, you're not compromising, you're sacrificing. Mm. And those sacrifices can be good in some instances. Not when it's very important to you or it's going to be important enough that it would cause you to wander if you're not getting it. Mm. Never sacrifice something that's going to make you want to look at someone else in your marriage. All right? So if you need three times a week to be happy and satisfied, right. make that very clear. Don't agree to two. Yeah. And then, yeah. And <laughs> and then now, wander. Yeah. Exactly. And now you're entertaining other people because you never set that expectation. Another expectation, as we talked about earlier with attraction is how we keep ourselves up physically. Mm. I do think so that needs to be discussed. what if I just gained 60 pounds in seven years, and is that okay since we're married now? Listen, people need to be honest. So, like I, I tell some men, if you can say, uh -huh. you know what, if my wife gains 60 pounds, I don't care, I'm cool with it, and you're going to love her with the same energy and desire that you did 60 other pounds ago, great. 
But if you can't maintain that desire, that passion, 60 pounds lift, you need to make that known now. Wow. You can't be afraid and say, well, that sounds too shallow. Oh, so would we rather be shallow now or have a Miserable. disastrous yeah. relationship later? Have you cheating on your partner mm. because you weren't willing to be honest in the beginning? All right? Same and, and women too, because an epidemic that's happening is women are less honest about their attraction needs, so to speak. All right? Really? So whenever we talk about attraction, letting yourself go, I think people automatically think of the woman letting themselves go. But a lot of men oh, yeah. <laughs> have let themselves go Absolutely. and have fallen far from what he looked like when they first got married. But she's not always being as honest and straightforward about that. One reason may be because she doesn't want the pressure on her. So that's that's one issue mm-hmm. right there. Or she may be afraid of his ego and, and, and think it's too her fragile. Humor, yeah. Exactly. And, and doesn't want to say anything. But again, if you can't maintain the same passion and desire mm-hmm. with that fall off, you got to be honest about that. So he understands. Because what happens is this. So let's just use this example. He lets himself go. He lets himself go. The sex falls off. All right? And the sex is falling off because she's not as attracted to him anymore. Yeah. But she's not being honest about it. Now, when she does say anything about whether it's his weight or whatever the case may be, he's going to think you're just making excuses. You're just trying to give a reason not to have sex right. rather than embracing it as this is the reality of what's holding us back. However, if we had this conversation from the jump and you were honest about it, then I always knew mm. this would be an issue. Not when you bring it back up. It's going to be like, yeah, you did tell me wow, if yeah. this happened. So now it's going to be easier for me to embrace that and actually do something yeah, about it. And have the recognition and awareness about it because we'd already talked about it. Exactly. Now you do a lot of these events and workshops for you know, hundreds of women at a time, are women opening up in these experiences when you're c- connecting with them and saying, yes, I do lose the attraction, like appearances are important to me, or or is it not as important? And you're, from the events that you've done with the women you've talked to, what is the feedback on appearance and looks? So I will say this, when it comes to appearance, looks, and sex, Women aren't as vocal and transparent mm. in a group of people. Really? Yes. But one-on-one with you. One-on-one, different story. So same thing like using the sex example. If I ask a group of women, are you getting orgasms regularly? There's going to be women in there who lie because they don't want to feel inadequate. They don't want to be the woman who doesn't raise their hand and say, yes, I'm getting it good. So they're going to be hesitant or not know how to answer it. But if I ask in private... Now I'm going to get the real yeah, truth. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and now she's going to be very clear about loss of attraction, lack of sexual satisfaction, and all these things. So that's why people have to be careful because I think sometimes we're assuming these issues don't really exist because we're not hearing it in that group setting. Don't be fooled. Some women just they feel more comfortable privately expressing those things. And I've heard it enough times to know this is real. And again, you just yeah. have to, even if you haven't heard it enough times, pay attention. Yeah. There's a reason why we're seeing people fall off in marriage. There's a reason why we're seeing this disconnect. And even when it comes to infidelity, there's a great focus on men who've cheated. But there's a lot women. of women who've cheated. A lot of women. And it's not always for emotional reasons. It's for sexual ones too. So again, my, my thing is not to sit here and say, well, it's about who does work. It's about, okay, how do we fix this? How do we make mm. this better? And we have to accept that, yes... There are contributing factors to why we see failed marriages, why we see infidelity, why we see disconnects in our relationships. Let's address the underlying issues and be honest about it so we can get this on the right track. Wow. Are there any um, relationships that you're aware of that uh, have open relationships that are successful? Or do you think it's very hard to do? (laughs) Because more and more with the Burning Man scene and all these people exploring Mm. these things, what's your thoughts on you know, open relationships or, you know, being together, but also having multiple partners. So I'm going to be honest. Um, I, I'm very skeptical of open relationships. Now, I don't want to sit here and say it's impossible for it to be successful because I haven't met everybody and Mm -hmm. I haven't studied it enough, but I have studied it to a certain extent. And from what I have found is, again, a lot of open relationships stem from one, the perception that one person can't fulfill me. And since one person can't fulfill me, why not have more than one, Mm -hmm. all right? And to me, find a person who's experienced that deep and genuine connection, they don't have that perception. Mm. Because they had a moment in their life where they met someone that they thought 
this could be it. Wow. I could put my all into this and I would be happy with this one person. If you haven't experienced that connection, of course, you, there's, there's a natural progression to thinking, well, maybe it's not going to work with just one. Can I entertain multiple if I can even handle right. multiple? The other thing is, I do think it also stems from a lack of successful monogamy. And when I say a lack of successful monogamy, I don't necessarily mean that they weren't able to maintain monogamy. It's like, okay, if I get in this monogamous relationship and now I get cheated on, or I've had multiple relationships where I've been cheated on, I may start to think, what's the point of trying to be monogamous? Right. It's not I gonna might work as, anyways. Exactly. Why not just get an open relationship, which one allows me to not be so vulnerable to one person? Right. I now have more emotional control. And what you'll find in a lot of situations is there's still somebody running that show. And what I mean by that is... One of the people are running the show. Exactly. And they're running it in a way that it's protecting them. There's two parts to the letter, or two drafts. The first draft is the most important. This is where we're going to have essentially an emotional detox. We got to get everything out. So let's say on the list is your mother. I always bring up mothers because <laughs> so many people have mommy issues, but the world only wants to talk about daddy issues. Ooh. All right? And... The society has made it to where it's almost wrong for you to tell a woman she was a bad mother or to criticize your mother. So we suppress that a lot more than we do our fathers. That's interesting. You know? So let's say it's your mother and um, you're going to do the first draft. And in that first draft, you're just going to let all your raw emotion out. I don't care if you curse her out. I don't care if you wish death on her. I don't care what nasty, <laughs> evil thing you say. However you feel, let it come out. You've got to let the anger, the hurt, all pour out of you into this letter. Once you uncork that screw, uh, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. And this is where it gets heavier. A lot of people may take a lot more pauses in this process, all right? Because, again, so many people have been suppressing this for so long. Mm. And, again, it's like any other detox. When you start to detox, the bad stuff has to come out first, yeah. all right? And you can't get to a healed place unless you flush out all the negative energy. So this is why it's important. This is not the draft to be politically correct, to, to try to frame things in the right way. I don't want you to be considerate. I don't want you to think about, well, I did some wrong things too. Forget all that. This first draft is let it rip. Let it rip, let it out. And I guarantee you by just doing that first draft, you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel a weight come off your shoulders. You're going to feel more peace to you. Great. That's the draft one. Draft That's two. Draft, draft two. two. <laughs> So draft two is essentially now, I always tell people, all right, you finish draft one, pray, meditate, whatever you got to do, just get to a kind of level place mentally. Calm, all right, yeah. Calm. And now read the letter to yourself as if you were them. Oh! Okay? <laughs> and now, so put yourself in their shoes and anything that now comes off as attacking, condescending, blatantly insulting, you're going to change it. You're not changing the message. You're just changing your delivery of the message, all right? And the importance behind this is twofold. One, we talked about it earlier. People don't know how to communicate without being negative. Their tone, their delivery is horrible. So this letter is going to help you learn how to take your negative emotions and thoughts and now turn it and reword it into a much more loving, positive message. Mm -hmm. Now, loving, positive does not mean you won't say some things that aren't hurtful to them or a hard pill for them to swallow. There's just a difference between lashing out and expressing how you feel. Mm. Saying, this is how you impacted my life. This is how I perceive things. Rather than, you're this, you're that, you're this. That's the first draft. But the second draft is just, you're just changing your delivery of the message. So by the end of it, you have fully expressed yourself, but in a more calm, loving manner. This is going to allow, one, it's going to teach you how to be better in your communication. Interesting. But also, huh. and this is the part people aren't going to like, and, and I won't go too deep into this part. For those who may have to send it, and I would just suggest getting the book to see if they got to send it or not, all right? Because it breaks all of this down. But for those who do have to send it, it's going to give you a much greater chance of great things to come from that letter. Mm. Not that that's the focus of the letter. The focus of the letter is for your healing. So I don't care if you did send it and they never responded. I don't care if they sent, if you sent it and they rejected everything you said in it. Because the purpose is your release uh -huh. of all those emotions, all right? And you've got to embrace forgiveness. And forgiveness is another piece of this healing puzzle. Forgiving them and forgiving yourself as well. That's the real focus. But I have seen amazing things happen 
because of these letters. Really? Yes. From people receiving them. Yes. I've seen. Uh, so these are not these are not letters that you send out that say you're horrible, you ruined my life. That's not draft one. You're sending out draft two, which is more of a place of this is how this scenario impacted me. Yeah, this is how you're you made me more, feel. It's more of a responsibility as well, how it made me feel is that I'm hearing you say. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. because it's it, it very different to accuse someone and attack someone versus saying, but this is how I received it. Right, whether you're right or wrong. Exactly, because also understand this. Hurt people hurt people. And, and some people might reject that because they say, well, I'm hurt and I never hurt nobody. That's a lie. Whether you realize it or not, you have hurt people. Mm. One example I'll give that comes to mind, let's say you're a woman or a man and you were hurt in your last relationship and now you've become guarded. Now to you, you're still operating as a loving human being, but what you don't realize is your guardedness is still hurting either the potential partner or mm -hmm. someone that you do get True. with because you're unwilling to give them your whole heart. Wow. All right? So you still you're have not a, You're not them. attacking them. Maybe you're not punching them Ex or cheating on them, Ex but you're holding back. Exactly. Wow. And you're still undermining the relationship. So you're still hurting them and, and you're hurting yourself because you're not allowing yourself to experience the full greatness of it mm -hmm. because you won't fully dive in because you're scared and you're guarded and that has to be fixed. But going back to the, the original point I want to make is in that same mode, the hurt person does not always realize how much they're hurting you. We have to understand that damaged individuals are operating from a very selfish mindset. It's I'm protecting myself. Think about the person who is overly critical of everyone else. They're always criticizing, criticizing, mm -hmm. criticizing. They're not doing it because their intention is to hurt others. They're doing it because they want to keep the spotlight off of them and to protect themselves from right. criticism. So I'm going to hit you before you hit me. Dang. All right. So again, a lot of our parents, the things that they did, they did not understand. And even if they had some semblance of an idea, they're so caught up in their own feelings, they're blinded by it. So a lot of times this letter basically takes the blinders off. When you do it in that loving manner, because like I said earlier, do you want to be heard or do you want them to receive the message? Mm. The yelling, the screaming, the lashing out, they heard that because you may have done that with them in the past, right. but they never received you in that moment. Now expressing yourself in a calm, loving manner, they can't help but receive you. And even those who reject what you're saying, trust me, it has hit them in a way nothing else has. Right. And I've seen situations where the offender has broken down in tears after realizing how bad they were being. Wow. But they never connected with that previously because their emotions, their feelings blinded them from that. It's a lot, man. <laughs> first two steps sound like a pretty deep work. It is. It is absolutely deep work, but it's necessary work. I mean, listen, no one says healing is easy, but it's necessary and it's absolutely worth it. And, and it it's a game changer. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't think people understand how much better your life will be. And you know what? Let's take a moment to say this isn't even about your emotional relationship life. It's about your overall quality of life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people's illnesses are from a lack of emotional health, all yeah, right? that's true. And what we have to understand is a suppression of feelings, a lack of healing creates emotional stress. Stress is now the number, is not now, it's always been the number one inducer of disease. It is the number one trigger that sets everything else wrong in your body, all right? If you cure stress, you cure the body. A lot of things, it, it changes mm -hmm. after that. So your overall health, your overall quality of life is dependent on you healing and releasing that negative energy. So it's it's so much bigger than just a relationship. Overall quality of life. Yes. Not just in that one relationship, but every relationship. Every relationship, life. every aspect of life. So do you write a letter for the 30 people that were on that <laughs> who hurt you list? Or is it more, okay, pick like, the three or two or three big people in your life that you really were affected by, start with those letters and then keep going? Start with those letters. And what I have seen in, in, in all my years of doing this is that... And you're not... And sometimes you don't send it to the person also, right? There's going to be some circumstances where you wouldn't send it. Majority of the times, I would encourage sending it. Mm. All right? Now, again, I tell people that if you're a believer, pray about it as well. Um, because to me, God gives you the ultimate answer in that. But I do believe that the vast majority of situations, the letter needs to be sent. All right. Yeah. But again, there are some caveats there. There are some differences. Uh, but, and you had asked what again? 
Um, do you send a letter to everyone on the hurt list? Oh, so yes. Um, what I have seen from most people is that once you knock off the big ones, first three, four, five people. Yeah, you don't need to write a letter. You don't to have to write a letter to everybody else because again, every you see things differently now. So now think about it like this: your hurt or how you took offense to something, you now see it differently after you resolve those other ones. Now you realize it wasn't even about you in those situations. Mm -hmm. Again, hurt people hurt people. They're just projecting negativity onto you. It wasn't even about you. They just took it out on you. And now when you now start to not internalize people's actions, it frees you in a way that you were yeah. never freed before. Yeah. You know, And that's why it's so important that we have to learn not to take things personally because we don't know where that person's actions and negativity is really coming from. A lot of times, most of the times, it's not even about us. It goes way deeper than that. And if we learn not to take it personally and not to internalize it, we can navigate the situation so much better. Right. Because what's happening is you allow them to trigger you. Now you get into a negative space. Now you fight fire with fire and the fire gets worse. That's been me most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my previous relationships, that's how I showed up, which was I'm doing it to defend myself. Mm -hmm. You're attacking me for something, whether it's true or not, I'm gonna defend myself and I'm gonna fight back. What happens when we do that with our partner? We just make it a battle. Yeah. We set the stage for more battling. And here's the, hor the worst part about it. We not just battle in that moment. That battle usually turns into saying something we regret, mm. doing something that we, you know, we didn't realize we did. Now they hold on to that. So now they take that one small thing from that battle. Well, for years. Exactly. That creates more battles. So you don't win. You don't win trying to fight fire with fire. So what should you do if someone's fi fighting you with fire? How should you respond? You throw water on them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? A bucket and, of water. And that water is love, patience, mm. grace. And if they don't honor that, you let them go. Unfortunately, listen, if, if, if we're in a relationship, whether that be family or romantic, and we're dictating to them that, listen, the way we do things here is we have calm conversation, we be respectful to, towards each other, we, you know, we, we don't take this to a negative place, and they cannot honor that then you stop engaging with What if person. someone says, you know what, don't try to tell me how to act and how to feel. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to react at times. It's natural to let your, you know, let yourself feel these things. These are human emotions. And it's okay to argue every now and then. Don't try to tell me what to do. Again, a moment. So if I'm in a relationship and we, we've set the standard of healthy communication, and my partner has a moment where she starts to yell and go crazy or whatever, right? And I, and I recognize this is a moment. I might let that slide. As, and when I say let it slide, I don't mean not acknowledge the issue. I simply mean, okay, let, it get, let her get it out. Let her vent, all right? Now, once it's done, remind her that, listen, we're not doing that. Like, that, ha that was a moment. We don't make that a consistent pattern, all right? So we keep that there. I, I let you have that moment. But we don't get to keep doing that. Because that's unhealthy. And if you feel like, well, everyone should be able to just let... No, that's not how we do things here. Listen, everyone has to set the standard of what is acceptable in their relationship or acceptable in engaging with anyone. And again, this isn't just romantic relationship. My mm -hmm. family knows. I don't argue. I don't argue with nobody. <laughs> okay? You can disagree. I disagree, but we're not arguing. What's it, the difference between disagreeing and arguing? Again, disagreeing is simply respectfully, calmly... And, and, and when I say call me, we can get passionate, but we don't get disrespect, disrespectful, we don't get negative or toxic, and we simply state our opposing beliefs You don't to have something. an attitude that you're wrong and bad, how could you think that? Exactly. Now again, that takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of work depending on how you've grown up and what you've engaged in, but that has to be the goal. The goal and it's not so hard if we just practice and mm -hmm. stick to practicing it. Like we can't just keep making excuses for being all over the place and acting out of character. No, we have to set a certain standard and we have to adhere to that standard. Mm -hmm. All right. And if you can't, okay, then we can't keep talking. End of story. Like, I'm not going to entertain, like, even in social media, if someone leaves a negative comment, I'm not answering that. For what? I can recognize who are the people that just want to go back and forth with you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not arguing with you. I will state my case. You either take it or you don't. Right. That's it. Yeah. Speak your truth 
and leave it at that. What would be, let's say, okay, I did step one. I wrote the list. I started writing letters. I sent some of these letters out, but I'm still not, I'm still feeling triggered. I still don't feel healed. Is there more steps to yes. healing 101? <laughs> or is, is, uh, is it just now is it time? No. So the other part I mentioned earlier was forgiveness. Oh, all yeah. right. And forgiveness is a huge part. But what people have to understand with forgiveness is forgiveness isn't a snap of the finger thing. All right. Meaning you could do all of this. You can say, I forgive them. I'm good. I'm moving forward. And like you said, two, three weeks later, something happens and you're triggered. You got to keep forgiving. Exactly. For In that moment, you have to stop yourself. See, the mistake we make is that when we get triggered, we allow ourselves to dive into it. We dwell in that moment. And so now you're, you're staying in that negative place. What you have to do is recognize the moment, say, no, I forgave them. What's done is done. I'm moving forward. And that's it. Keep practicing it. And as you practicing, practice it, you'll notice you're triggered less. You'll notice it's affecting you less. Now you'll get to a point where it doesn't bother you at all. You're not phased by it. So it's a reprogramming of the brain to say, you know what, this, is not, this doesn't matter anymore. It's done. It's in the past. But it's not just forgiving them, it's forgiving ourselves. And that's a big hurdle for a lot of people. There are people listening to this who will be able to say, I forgave that person, but you're still beating yourself up. You're still holding the mistake over your own head. Whatever that is. And you have to learn that we all make mistakes. We all fall short. Learn from them. Grow. Move forward. Do not dwell on them. And so it's the same thing. Every time you find yourself beating yourself up, no, I forgive myself. I'm done. What's done is done. I'm moving forward. That's it. You keep saying it to yourself. You will get to a place where it doesn't bother you anymore. Is it harder to forgive someone that did something horrible to you or is it harder to forgive yourself? It depends on what they did. <laughs> I think I think you know that's going to vary from situation to situation. Um, but I will say, if I had to lean towards one, I would say forgiving ourselves is harder. Why is it harder? Because we live with ourselves. Because we live with ourselves. Yes. You see, like that person can do that one thing, and it can be very hurtful. Mm. But we may not see them again. Um, we we may not face a circumstance like that again. There may be buffers in our life that allows us to detach from what happened. But when we make our mistake, we have to live with that. Mm. We have to face ourselves in the mirror. And then there may be other mistakes we make that pile onto that. You see, that person may have one offense that we have to forgive them for, but we can end up having several offenses against ourselves. And now it becomes a harder journey for a lot of people to just Except that we're, we're all flawed and we, we're all going to fall short. I'll, I'll keep saying that. We, we, none of us get it perfect. None of us has never made a mistake. And you know how they say even in business, everyone who's successful has failed. And so in life, it's the same thing. Anyone who's successful at life has made mistakes. You're either going to learn from them or you're going to dwell on them. And too many people are dwelling in their mistakes. Is there anything in your life you haven't healed yet? Um... <laughs> you really fool me on the spot today. Ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I will. I, I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but I will say, <laughs> I will say that I've done the letter before. All right, so I've done this whole process. Sometimes you need to write multiple right. letters to the same person. And, and, no, so the, the person I did it for, um, I, 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 I did all the the big ones, so to speak. But there was a small one uh, with a family member that I didn't realize was a problem till years after ah. because it to me at the time i kind of brushed it under the rug it's whatever no big deal now i will say this and i'm not trying to make excuses the the issue i don't believe has any detrimental impact on my relationships all right because i do believe there are no you're right you're right you're right i'm not listen i'm gonna handle it if the letter's gonna be written <laughs> when right? by when by next week by next what week. day? Give me till. You know what? Why not write it on your flight home? <laughs> I write it on your flight home. You know what? I'll do it today. Let's go, baby. I like that. I like that. I'll do it today. Okay. I got time with the whole thing. So you'll, you'll, write, you'll write the letter you need to write. Yes. And then is this a letter you send to this person? Yeah, that one will be sent. Absolutely. Mm, interesting. Now, do you do a two step, two step process there where you write 
or a two draft process where you write. Yeah, I would still do. Blah, I would do and then I truly believe in in all those steps, and mm. I believe that we should not skip any of them because skipping them can really throw things off. Mm. All right, because again, you don't want to say, "Well, I'm not really that mad, so I don't need draft one," right? But then, for all you know, you've been suppressing more anger than you realize. Just so you, say, "I." hate you because <laughs> exactly. start it with that yes and let it rip yes and if nothing really comes great but allow yourself exactly. to go as crazy as you want exactly so i would not skip a step and i would i would encourage everyone if you do this process do not skip steps don't remix steps i've seen some people say well i didn't do a letter i sent a text no it doesn't, doesn't work exactly it's not the same thing you can't send a text you can't do one draft you don't skip things. Do the whole thing. Why as does a writing line. a letter? Why is that more powerful than typing or texting or voice messaging a, a letter? So, because voice message, text, typing is not bad. All right, so you can type a letter. Type or writing is out. fine. Yes, but text and voice message is bad because inherently and subconsciously, those are quick hitting ways of expressing ourselves. Mm. All right. We don't do a voice message to leave a 10, 15 minute message, all right? We typically do it for a quick one minute, two minute, three. It can be longer at times, but there's this thing in us that doesn't allow us to really draw it all the way out. Because if what you're feeling needs to be a 30 page long letter, you're not gonna do a 30 page worth voice memo, chances are. Unless you wrote it first and then you expressed it through a voice recording. Or what you can do is you could record yourself, all right? Let it all out in recording and then re-record the second draft. So you can do it by voice recording, but when it's a text voice memo and all that kind of stuff or text messages, because again, texts are condensed ways of expressing ourselves. They're not made for long expressions. So even if you say, well, I can, no, you can't, it's just not gonna work the same. And it's, it's very easy for you to feel like, well, typing all of that, and if you gotta go back to type more, and it's gonna spread over to like 10, 20 texts, most people aren't gonna do that. They're gonna try to make it shorter. So no, right. do the letter, but the alternative, voice recording is an acceptable method. Wow. Okay. So we've talked about, so that's the thing you still need to heal, still work on yourself personally, is writing that letter. Yeah. And I will say this, because I want, I want it to be understood that I do believe there's some level of blockage because of it. So even though I said I don't think it had, or I don't believe, and I'm pretty confident in but saying it, it doesn't have, yeah, there's, it's always a might. You're right. It's always possible. But I guess from, from my evaluation, I don't see it pouring into any of my, rom uh, into a romantic relationship. But, Never know. And, and let me say this, not directly, but indirectly. So what I mean by that is, Sometimes the things that we're holding on to, and this is just maybe a random example, but let's say the weight of these things causes you to fall into depression at times, all right? So even though you may not mm. see it as I'm directly going to be negative towards my partner, you falling into depression impacts the relationship. It's still you being a hurt person. Exactly, and they have to deal with that. Yeah. So, there, so it wow. can't always indirectly impact our relationships and that's why it's important for us to not sweep it under the rug and so and so that's why i'm completely committed to doing it and i was planning on doing it because i know that i don't want to leave any stone unturned you know what i'm saying how long have you been thinking about this uh, since the beginning of the year uh, <laughs> <laughs> since the beginning of the year the time now now's the yeah, time. time wow it dawned on me in the beginning of the year i was like you know what i i think wow. i gotta do this but then I had went, like I had went somewhere and then it, you know, life and you yeah. just keep sleeping on the rock. And that's the mistake. That's the problem that we have. We let life get the best of us and we get busy and we get distracted. And again, doing these exercises isn't easy all the time, but we've got to commit to it. And we got to commit to understanding if we want the best for ourselves, for our life, for our relationships. We've got to cover all the bases when it comes to healing. Let's say... Uh Someone's single and they're meeting different people to date, right? And they don't want to, well, maybe you should, maybe this is something they should do. What would be three questions they should ask to know if they have the right connection with someone? Seeing as you said, connection is something that you can't create. You either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. What are three questions to ask that person 
in the first hour of, of meeting them if you think you have connection? I, I don't even think it's questions to ask. I'll give you three things they should do, mm. all right? Three things. Number one, be your authentic self, mm -hmm. all right? So no representative, no game playing, no trying to maneuver this because you really like this person and want them. No, just be yourself. And either they, they're going to like you and love you for who you are or they're not. What, right? does that, what does that mean? Like say everything that's on your mind, be as like quirky as you want to be, just be, unfiltered. If that's who you are, yes. No. If that's who you are. So if you're a So don't be on person, your best behavior of like, okay, I'm going to let this slide and this slide. No. So let me give you a perfect example. Um, let's say for a woman, she's dating a guy and she views this guy as very conservative. All right. So she thinks she has to come and be an angel on this day. Be good girl, all right? But lo and behold, she's a little scandalous. She's a little <laughs> out there, all right? But what she doesn't realize is he likes that. Right. He actually wants the side of her she's not showing, all right? But she's projecting what she thinks that she needs to bring to the table because of who she thinks he is. But she doesn't know the full real him. So a lot of people don't even realize they're shooting themselves in the foot because you're doing who you you're being what you think you should be. Rather than just be yourself. Mm. And if they are, if they're connecting with that, great. If they don't, so be it. Let's not play any games with each other. So again, if you're quirky, be quirky. If you're a very affectionate person, be affectionate. Granted, there can be boundaries drawn so that we don't make any confusion as to sure. setting the wrong message. But don't hinder being your true self. Yes. Because that only throws things off. Okay. That's Second one. thing is be very honest and transparent. All right. So it's one thing to be yourself, but sometimes when the conversation goes into certain areas, we we don't want to be open and honest about what we're thinking or how we feel. Let's say, for example, not that people should be, need to be talking about politics on the first date, but let's just say they ask you about politics, right? Say how you feel. Yes, because what purpose does it serve for you to try to dodge it, to then find out later that you guys don't don't get together? Right. Perfect example. I had a client one time who met this guy, she felt that he, he, there was a connection there, she felt like this was it, right? And they had some other issues, but one of the, stickling, the sticking issues they had was, he was a Trump supporter, she was not. Wow. Okay? Now I said, listen, so you're telling me that you guys may not get together over a man who will only be president for X amount of years, <laughs> okay? But your relationship can span way past that. Now I understand for people it goes deeper than that. There's values or something exactly. else. Exactly, yeah, yeah. but the point is, if he would have, if he swept it under the rug and tried to just avoid the political, his political just to get standing, you to like him. exactly, yeah. only for it to come out later and destroy everything, you only delayed the inevitable. I'd rather know that we're not on the same page from day one than to wait into year one or year two. That makes no sense. All right. And again, to me, if there's a true connection, we're either going to have the same values or we're going to be able to work through them. Yeah. Because connection does not mean that everything is going to be in perfect alignment as far as how we see things. But we will be able to embrace each other's differences. That difference wouldn't make us want to walk away from each other. Mm -hmm. All right? So again, be yourself and open th answer things openly and transparently so we're not leaving uh, any mystery here or playing any games. Yep. And then the third thing? The third thing is just be aware. And, and to me... What I mean by that is, and I'm going to use men right now, because I do feel like as men, we'll meet a woman, and again, she might be awesome, be great. And a lot of times we know deep inside, something's not there. She's just not the one. But we really like her, or we really like aspects about her, so we want to hold on to this. So you're allowing this desire to mm. blind you and not allow you to be aware of the fact that, no, you know she's not it. And accept that. Accept that and walk away, end it, because there's no point in dragging this on. At the very least, if you want to continue it, then be honest about this ain't going anywhere. And if we want to have fun, if you want to have fun with each other, that's two adults making their own decision. But don't, don't continue on under the guise of, I'm, I'm looking for a serious relationship with this woman when I know deep inside she's not the one for me. Yeah. All right? And the same thing happens with women. It's like, yo, just be aware, because I, I would tell you, everyone that I've spoken to about connection, and, and has expressed that they've experienced this, it was pretty much an instant thing. Mm. It wasn't an overtime thing. So as long as you're aware. That's why you hear some people are like, we got married in like three months. Yes. Because we just knew. 
Like something was connected. Exactly. And, and what I hate that's happening in society now is love bombing. All right. So love bombing is a hot topic. And I, and I one day want to do a video on it. But people view these fast moving relationships as, oh, it's love bombing. Oh, it's toxic. And it's like, that's not every situation. And I think one of the most important things to understand about love bombing is love bombing is a one way action, meaning it's one person trying to overwhelm you with all this love to get you to buy into it and move forward. Connection is a two way experience. When two people are feeling this draw to each other, yeah. both feeling into each other, that's real. You shouldn't run from that. And you shouldn't say, oh, it's happening too fast. I would argue real love, real connection is fast. That, that, that over time mm. stuff is you're learning to tolerate each other. You're becoming attached to each other. You, you're becoming conditioned to each other's presence. It's not actual real love or connection. I want to ask you about the best ways to meet someone these days, 2020 moving forward, the do's and don'ts for online dating. But what I'm hearing you say is that you shouldn't be trying to meet someone. You shouldn't be doing the online dating game until you've fully healed or at least started the process of healing because healing is a journey. Sometimes things take a lot longer to heal fully, um, but at least acknowledging and, and starting that process. What would be a process to start healing your past relationships or pains before we get into the conversation of do's and don'ts of online dating? Okay. So of course, going to a therapist or coach is the, the ideal thing to do. Um, you, you typically need that outside party that can help you process some things, help you see new perspectives and go through a process of healing. Now, I will be honest, not every coach or therapist is going to help someone heal. Sometimes it just turns into a venting session. So you've got to be real careful about, okay, if I've been going to this therapist or coach for many weeks or months now, what progress have I really made? Have I, have I been resolving or have I been coping? Because many are teaching you how to cope and manage and, and how to function within your brokenness, but they're not resolving it and helping you heal. Now, of course, you know, I'm big on healing. So I have my book, Love After Heartbreak, which gives people the exact steps to healing. So one of the steps, I'll give you the first step, is um, getting the hurt out in front of you. So it's this who hurt me list. And so you get a piece of paper, you write down who hurt me and you ask yourself the question, who hurt me? And now everyone who comes to mind, you put them on the paper. Doesn't matter if it happened very long ago. Doesn't matter if you think you moved past it. If they come to mind when you ask the question, then that means there's some kind of relevance there. And so now you put them on the paper and like two sentences of what they did to hurt you. This will now at least help us identify what you've been holding on to and where the hurt is and what needs to be properly addressed. And then from there, we can do the other steps of getting things off your chest and forgiveness and all these different things that's involved in healing. I love that. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of writing letters to people that you never send them, telling them how, you, how it made you feel, what you're, what you're frustrated and angry about with them, forgiving them, letting it go. And then I like to burn the letter and bury it as well in the, gro <laughs> in the ground to hopefully create a sense of like, okay, this was alive in me and now I'm killing this and this, this feeling, this energy, and I'm, I'm putting it to bed and I'm putting it back in the world to hopefully create something new, to grow something new and more loving and powerful and create that intention. Uh, but I think that's really important. When should we know that we have, are healed enough? How do we know when our healing has gone far enough down its journey before we should get into meeting someone new, putting ourselves out there on social media, online dating apps, and things like that? All right. Well, first thing I want to say is, now there are going to be times where sending the letter to the person is actually the best thing to do. Really? Yes. A lot of people are scared about that. And it's a very difficult hurdle to jump. But I literally got a DM today from a woman who read the book. She wrote her letter last year. It was to her mother. She didn't want to send it. She held on to it. She said she just finally built up the courage because I, I tell them in the book, 99% of the time, I'm going to tell you to send the letter. Wow. And so she finally did it. And she said they end up having the best conversation they've ever had in their life. Now they're like the best of friends. Like it's taking their relationship to a whole new level. And, and it's not, that's not the purpose of sending it, but there's so much good that can come from taking the extra step of actually sending the letter and making sure that person is aware of how you felt and, and, and what you were going through. 
Now, in regards to knowing when you've properly healed, number one thing is when you can embrace being fully vulnerable with somebody. All right. If vulnerability still scares you, you have not healed enough. All right. You've got to be willing to open your heart. We can't say we want love and then put walls up around our heart and be afraid to give it to someone. You're contradicting yourself. You're working against yourself. So you've got to be willing to be vulnerable. You also have to make sure any negative perceptions that you've held on to due to past experiences, you're, you've done away with them. So for example, if you have been saying all men are dogs because you've been hurt by so many men, well, you can't be out there dating and still screaming all men are dogs. That's right. not going to work in your favor. You've got to accept that good men exist that you can receive a great man, that you deserve a great man. So when you have a more positive outlook and, and way of thinking, and listen, we're going to all have our negative thought moments. That happens. But your dominant or more consistent thought pattern is positive, hopeful and, and things of that nature now we, you, we can say you're ready to get back out there how important is the language or the inner thoughts the actual physical words we use in the inner language the inner dialogue in terms of attracting or finding the right partner it's extremely important you know we, we hear it all the time words are power and the reality is that the words you speak to yourself the thoughts you have they will, whether knowingly or unknowingly to you, they will dictate your energy, the energy that you give off to people or the, the, the way that your spirit comes across to individuals. And so you can put on a happy face, but if your thought is negative, pessimistic, all right, and dwelling in this, then your energy will still be negative. All right, what you do on the surface isn't going to be able to hide that, which is why you have some people who swear, well, I'm not a bad person. Yeah, but you're not a positive person. All right. You, right. you can be good people, but no, you are miserable. And, 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 it's, and it's not even just you're miserable, like you're, you're dwelling in it in your life, but you give off miserable energy. And so who's going to want to be around that? Who's going to want to commit to that? At the most, they might want to have sex with you, but they're not going to want to tie themselves to you in a committed long-term relationship or marriage. And people can feel that energy. What, I don't care if you're a man, woman, or in between. Some, you can feel the energy of someone. And if you haven't healed properly yourself, you may be attracted to a wounded individual to then try to find some validation or try to find some connection there. And that's why it's important for you to heal so that you can fully see the energy around you and see who is a potential great match for you. Because if you haven't healed, you're going to keep attracting negativity and repeating certain patterns. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And, and if you talk to any person who has healed, they can tell you how they feel energy even more now, where they become more aware. It's so much easier to see past the facades that so many people are putting up because now healing allows us to get more in tune with our spirit. And by getting more in tune with our spirit, we get more in tune with everyone's spirit because technically we are all connected through the spirit. All right. And so it's easier to be in touch with that when you get away, get rid of the blockage of trauma, past disappointments and hurts, disappointments, things of that nature. It's powerful stuff, man. I'm still trying to get to my, one of my first questions, which is what's the best way to meet someone these days in online dating? But it sounds like that's so far ahead of what you need to be uh, thinking about first. Like, have I started to heal? Are there people who have hurt me? Are there people that I need to apologize to? You know, all these different things. It's almost like you got to do the work before you can start doing the work of finding someone. Absolutely. So I think it's important for us to remind people of this process first before we say, okay, you've done the work. You've started the process of healing. You feel like you can open your heart and be vulnerable to anyone and it's not going to hurt you and cripple you. Now, once you've done that, what's the best way to meet someone these days? You know, we got tons of social media apps now. We got people just swiping left and right on TikTok and Tinder and Bumbles and what else, whoever else knows is out there. I feel like if I was a single man right now, it would just be chaos because it would just be <laughs> option overload, nothing's ever good enough, comparison overload. Like where do we meet someone these days who is a quality human being that could be a potential great partner for us? So I definitely think people need to – get rid of the negative stigma they have of online dating. I think, again, it's a tool to meet people more conveniently. And in times like this, it's 
probably the best tool. Let's be real. I mean, even if you try to go out, certain cities are limited. You're not going to see as much people out anymore. So if you thought it was hard to meet people going out before, well, it, it just got harder. So being open to online dating, I think, would be the best bet. I think what people have to realize is, I, so I've gone on some of these sites to like do research and see what's going on. And I can tell you that people's online profiles are pure trash. Like the majority <laughs> of people have no damn clue what they're doing with these online dating profiles. And I, and I believe it, it's because many have this one foot in, one foot out approach. It's like, I'm going to just try this because there's nothing else going on, but I'm not actually committed to the process of making this work. And how it's like, a bo- they're just bored. This is like entertainment. Yes. This is, they're craving connection and intimacy, but they don't want to fully commit. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't fully buy into the fact that it can work. Like I have clients who have gotten married from online dating, so it can work. Now, does it guarantee you a husband or wife? No, but does it pretty much guarantee you can meet people and have some options to decide if you want to move forward? Yes. But again, you've got to be smart about how you uh, invest in the process and how you set up your profile and things of that nature to help you become more successful. What are the do's and don'ts of, of online dating? And I'm going to make a general assumption here, correct me if I'm wrong, that men in general go on online dating sites to find people to hook up with in general, mm-hmm. and women go on to more find a great potential partner. Please correct me if I'm wrong but I think that's the general mindset. Is that right? I think that's a general mindset. I I do think it varies depending on the site. Like I believe a site that makes men pay has a higher chance of serious relationship minded men being on there because the guy who just wants to hook up is less likely to want to spend any money if he can go to a free site and it's just, you know, a free fall on there. So I do think that certain sites give a better opportunity for serious relationships, but as far as do's and don'ts, one, one don't, I'm going to start with a don't, is don't make it all about what you want. Meaning people don't go on online dating and present their value. And so why would I choose you out of all these people online when I don't know what you bring to the table, what value you present? It's like, listen, in marketing, the job is to present value to the consumer, to say this is why you should buy my product. We dress it up properly. We, we pick the right colors, the right wording. It's all about hitting your target market and, and appealing to them. And I feel like people don't do that. They go online, they make it, well, I'm looking for this. I don't want this. Boom, 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 boom. All right. But I don't see any value here. So why would I reach out to you? Right. So I think that's a big don't. Don't make it all about you. Make it about what you bring to the table and what value you provide. Make those- yourself desirable so you start attracting options as opposed to saying, well, uh, yeah, I'm only looking for this guy and this. And you have to be smart and rich and this. It's like, <laughs> exactly. you're already too much to handle right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I'm- so that's number one. Build something, create desire yes. for someone to be attracted to you. What, what else? Number two have enough pictures on your profile. So many people jump on, and again, because it's one foot in, one foot out, they put one picture up. Now, listen, we live in a time where catfishing is popular and nobody wants to be catfished. If you only have one picture up, you become a very skeptical, or you make people very skeptical of your profile, all right? And so you gotta show people the full you. So not only have one picture, but I always say have at least one full body picture. Let people know what they're getting into because the last thing you want is to have these beautiful headshots, all right? And someone choose you based off of that. Then you meet in person and the rest of you doesn't look like the way they wanted you to look. And now you have a wasted date, wasted time. You get discouraged. Let's let's stop doing that to ourselves and to each other. Let's show the full version of who we are. Someone either likes it or they don't. All right. That's so I think three to and four pictures in your profile. That's interesting. And would someone ever change their mind based on personality only of like, oh, well, they're maybe it wasn't the way I wanted them to look, but they're such a nice person and I have this personality that I'm going to give it another date. Or are you saying like, allow people to see the full picture of who you are, at least to a certain level. Obviously, you're not going to share your whole life story and mm-hmm. open up all your flaws right away. You're going to put your best foot forward, mm-hmm. but at least see kind of a full picture of your life in 
five to six photos, I guess. So I, I don't want to sound harsh, but let's just say they looked at your picture and they thought you were an athletic person. They thought you had an athletic frame. All right. Now, when they see you, you're plus size. That may be too far of a deviation for them to say, oh, but the personality is good enough. All right. right. Now, you, they may have envisioned athletic, but you're like a little bit off from that. OK, well, you know what? She's a great or he's a great person. I can work with this. That's not going to push them too far to the left. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So it really depends on how far you've deviated. And that's why the pictures helps eliminate that issue. We don't need the guessing game. We don't need people feeling some kind of way once they finally see you. Don't use old pictures from 10 years ago if they don't represent how you currently look. You want to show your true self now and let them decide if they want to step into this or not. Is there another do or don't? Do not come off negative in your profile. So it kind of goes back to the whole saying what you want or making it all about you. Many people, and I have to say this happens a lot with women, they come off like, well, if, if you're this, don't, don't reach out to me or I don't want this. And the tone is very negative, all right? Like, the, I'm not here to play games. Okay, cool. That's not going to get you anywhere. That just makes you come off as difficult, all right? So you want to come off with a more positive, inviting tone. You want to be very mindful of your delivery in your bio, in your message or your headline or whatever. All that negative stuff, especially for women, is not going to get you far if you're looking for a serious relationship. Again, men will bypass the negative energy if they just want sex and you look good to them. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to bypass that to make you their woman and to commit to you or marry you. Right. That's powerful for women to know for sure. And do you think women can make the first move and it could work out long term? Absolutely. I, and I, I honestly think when it comes to online dating, they should. My logic is this. As a woman, you jump on online dating. Let's say you're an attractive woman. You put up your profile. And now in a couple of days, it's a sea of garbage that comes your way. All right. And you got to fish through the sea of garbage to find your diamond in the rough. And through that process, it can be very exhausting. You, you can find yourself feeling like this is pointless. And now you get off the platform. However, you should go and find the men you want to put yourself in front of. Mm. All right. Making it easier for you to get candidates you actually would like. And for women... We don't require much. You can just say hello. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> or a smiley like, face or whatever. Yeah, yeah. An emoji. Hey, you can send a blank damn message. All right. <laughs> if we are attracted to you and we find interest, we will respond. Like, did you mean to say that to me? Like, we're going to look into it. So, to me, it would be best and more, most beneficial for women to just send out, again, just simple messages to the men that actually catch their interest. Right. And then and see, see if they're interested in return. Yeah, exactly. My friend, uh, Matthew Hussey, I think he calls this in person, like the handkerchief technique, where he's like, listen, women, you know, look them in the eyes from across the, the restaurant or at the grocery store, like look a man in his eyes or connect with him in a flirtatious way, a little bit subtle little way. Or, you know, back in the olden days, they would drop a handkerchief as they walked by a man to see if they would pick it up and bring it to them. So it's like, allow a man to be interested in connecting with you because it takes a lot of courage even if you're online to put yourself out there to someone you're attracted to it's yes. it's easier to obviously just message someone online and not be rejected and feel so sad than it is in person but it's still you've got to put some energy out there for the guys that you're interested in for sure and see which ones are like you got to take a nibble you know exactly come, come on the hook so that's it I love that, man. What's the best opening line <laughs> for a man or woman in online dating to reach out to someone, to pique interest, and see if it's a potential for something? Okay. For men, what you want to do is you want your opening line to reference something she's written in her profile, which shows you actually took time to read her profile. You care. So, yeah, you research. Exactly. And, and it automatically separates yourself because... Let's face it, a, a woman on there might be getting tons of hellos, you look amazing, you look great, blah, blah, blah. She's heard that a million times, but let's just say she just got her degree in, I don't know, in uh, IT, all right? And now you say, oh, you know, hey, what do you like about IT? Oh, I don't know, you just make some kind of reference right. to it. it. It just shows that you took more time 
to actually learn. You come across much more genuine and the message is immediately different from the typical man who reaches out to her. So I think that's the best approach for men to take. Um, and it also allows for a natural conversation to flow. Cause you know, when you're starting with the whole, hello, where are you from? It's like, uh, exactly. But when you have a, a pick a topic using her profile to start it off, you got something that you can get rolling from there and then you can get into all the other stuff. And people always appreciate someone who takes the, t uh, the time to research. People always appreciate a different approach, a different angle, like a uniqueness mm -hmm. to something about you. But if you're always the same as everyone else of like, hey there cutie or whatever it is, you're gonna get the same type of results. But when you are a little different, they're gonna say, huh, something's different about that person. Let me keep yeah, talking. Absolutely, absolutely. And for women? For women, you know, I really just feel like saying hello is just, it's all they need. They don't have to say much. Because let's be real, like the man is either gonna be interested in you because he likes what he sees and he likes your profile. Like a special line for a woman doesn't really separate them, so to speak. Um, she could try to be funny and humorous. She could try to do the same thing that I said to men. But I think at the end of the day, it really boils down to, okay, if he likes what he sees and he likes what's on the profile, a simple hello, an emoji, whatever, is going to do the trick. Because a man's either going to respond and dive in or he's going to say, okay, hi, and that's it, and not get back quickly or whatever it is. So you're exactly. going to know quickly within 24 hours if a guy's interested in you as well or not. I, I always say there are some men who are still very shy and socially awkward even when it comes to online dating. And so there may be a struggle with how they communicate. But I do think that at the very least, they're going to respond. All right. right, right. They're going to respond. And from there, a conversation can be had. And I do think within the first few responses, we're going to get an idea of, OK, this guy does have some kind of interest here. What are your thoughts on friends or matchmakers spotting connection where they say, hey, I've got a great person for you. You're going to love this guy. You're going to love this girl. You guys you know, are perfect for each other. Are friends actually good at spotting potential long-term connection? And are matchmakers good at this as well? So I, I don't want to rain on any matchmakers parade <laughs> or in any way, you know, take away from what they do. I cannot honestly say I believe that a matchmaker can spot connection. They can spot chemistry and compatibility. Mm. I do think that matchmakers can be very good in, in finding who would be uh, compatible with each other. But again, compatibility does not equal connection. Connection is something deeper. Again, it's within that spirit. And so for someone on the outside to identify that, that's, that's highly unlikely unless they have seen these two interact and have been in their presence. So essentially, if I see you with someone, I can say, or I see you with your girl, I can say, okay, I see the connection there because I'm seeing you to interact. I can feel the energy. But if I have my friend here and a female friend over there and I'm thinking, oh, these two people can have a connect. No, like there's no way to say that when I'm just going off of what I know of them rather than actually them interacting and seeing the energy there. So you can't guess, even if like these are two great people, they're going to hit it off. You can, it's rare that you could guess that they will actually hit it off until you see them connecting. Then you can spot, wow, they have a connection. Yes, I believe that. When we're talking about connection, yes, that would be the Got case. Got it. So what's the difference between connection, chemistry, and compatibility? So let's start with compatibility. Compatibility are traits that typically fit together, all right? So we're identifying, well, okay, she's a go-getter. She likes being outdoors. Um, she's very spiritual and he's, he likes the same things. So we're identifying traits that make them compatible. Some people may use the Zodiac to determine who is compatible. But again, Zodiac is really dependent on the traits that they have defined for that sign. And as long as those things are consistent or they are accurate in those cases, then they can say there's going to be some level of compatibility there. So there's going to be some level of fit there. All right. Chemistry is when two people know how to get along and flow with each other, work with each other. So chemistry doesn't necessarily require compatibility, all right? Because again, think about at work. We can go through uh, team building exercises and build chemistry with our work associates, all right? But we don't have to like them. 
Mm-hmm. We don't have to have the same interests as them. There has to, nothing else has to be in alignment, but we can learn how to work together and build and create something and make progress and be successful. So chemistry is very independent of that. But again, it's more so learning how to work with each other, flow with each other, get along with each other, coexist together, so to speak. Um, but again, it's very fluid. It can, it can come, it can go. All right. You can build chemistry. You can destroy chemistry. Mm. Connection is again with connection. You will have chemistry, but funny enough with connection, you may not have what people perceive as compatibility. So you can have two individuals who you would never think are a match for each other, but yet they are feeling this amazing connection with each other. Unexplainable. They never would have thought it would be this person, but it's there. All right. But again, you will have chemistry within connection. Connection doesn't come or go. It's either there or it's not. You cannot create it. You cannot destroy it. You can run from it. You can try to reject it. You can pile a bunch of trash on top of it, toxic energy, but it's still there. And it kind of goes back to, we talked about this before, where you, you're the one that put me on the, I forgot how you say it, the red string Chinese. Yes, yes, story. the red string. I still got it go. on. <laughs> exactly. And so no, no matter where you go in the world, no matter what you do. You'll feel sh- connection. Exactly. And that's why people with connection could fall apart tomorrow, meet back up 10 years later, and it's like they never stop talking. The connection is always there. So it's, that's why it's the strongest and most important of those three. Is it fair to say that you need all three to have the most fulfilling type of relationship. And if you're missing compatibility, there will always be some type of stress. No, I think, I think you need chemistry and connection. And again, if you have connection, you will have the chemistry. The reason why I say you don't need compatibility is because again, what people perceive as compatible doesn't always align with what actually allows two people to be connected and bond and all these wonderful things. So because of that, I would say compatibility uh, due to society's perce- perception of it is not necessary. It's the least needed thing. Yes. But to ha- but, so you shouldn't be coming into a relationship saying, wow, we're very compatible people. We like the same things. We come from the same background. We live in the same city. Our families live nearby. This makes sense. We should try this thing because look at how compatible we are. What I'm hearing you say is, you should make sure you have this connection that if you were gone for 10 years, you think about them, you dream about them, you always want to come back together, that that is more important than having chemistry and compatibility because with connection, you will have chemistry, Mm -hmm. but you may not be compatible. Exactly. And you're 100% accurate what you just said. Compatibility, and that's where a lot of people go wrong. They choose partners based off of compatibility. They choose partners based off of the logical deduction that this would make sense. This is a great opportunity. You know, we like the same things, blah, blah, blah. But those people find themselves miserable because they get caught up in the hype initially. But again, the connection that they need to really enjoy each other, um, the glue that keeps them together, the glue that helps them overcome difficult times, that's not there if you don't have connection. You know what I'm saying? And hell, it, it's, it's tough even when you have connection. So if you right. don't have it, it's <laughs> <laughs> so like, forget it, about it. Is connection something you can cultivate if you don't have? Or is it something you either have it together or you don't? You have it or you don't. You can't, you can't make it up out of thin air. You can't create it. Plenty of people have tried and fail miserably. It just doesn't work. You know, and that's why. Yeah, you hear this all the time of like, gosh, he looked amazing on paper. Like he just like had everything on paper. He checked every box. Mm -hmm. She checked every box, but there was just, ah, and they were such a good person. Mm -hmm. They're such a great person. But I just couldn't connect. Exactly. It just wasn't there. And let me tell you, that's one of the worst positions to be in. Oh, to be with this amazing, wonderful person <laughs> that you don't have a connection with. Because now, how do I justify and validate to myself, my friends, my family, who probably love this person? Love this person. <laughs> like, love them. <laughs> and like, yo, I got to tell them, no, it's just not there. The majority of people are not able to do that. They suck it up. 
and they try to push things along or they convince Ooh. themselves I'm, I'm tripping, I, maybe I'm being too picky, whatever. But then inevitably, that marriage or relationship still ends up ending. Why do certain women get into a relationship like that where the man isn't providing necessarily for himself or for the relationship and then stay with men like that? As we, it's like we talked about earlier, it's leverage, it's control, control. it's power. You know, it's he has to value me. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, listen, if, if she's having a hard time dating men of a higher stature, well, it just becomes easier to date that guy. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, in her defense, that woman, if she's not, if she's walking more in a masculine energy, she's going to attract men who don't have much going on for themselves. Why is that? Because, again, we attract that balance. It's a natural thing. You're not going to see a feminine woman being drawn to a very feminine man. It doesn't happen doesn't like happen. that. And that's the same way you won't see a very masculine man be drawn to a masculine woman. He may want to have sex with her. He may want to enjoy some things with her. He's not going to want to live life with her. Exactly. It's interesting. Because those energies conflict. We need balance. So what happens is that woman that's giving off more masculine, she attracts that man who he needs her. He needs her to stabilize his life. He needs her for the resources. He will tolerate that energy because he does not possess it within himself. Or he doesn't want to go out there and work hard. Or exactly. Whatever, yeah. So it's easier for him. And so, yes, she's getting more of those guys coming her way than the established man. And, and again, in her defense, after a while, it, you know, you start to say, well, maybe I should give one of these guys a chance. Right, right. Maybe I should try this out. Maybe nice this wouldn't guys. be so bad. They're good guys, yeah. yeah. And you know what? Sometimes they're not even good guys. They're just guys who are willing at that time to put in more effort. So he, here's the thing. Like, I was speaking to Jay, Jay Shetty, and he was saying when he first got with his wife, he didn't have a job. So he was able to spend every day right. with her, all right? <laughs> and she kind of got accustomed to this. And I bring his example to say, a lot of times that guy who doesn't have anything going on for himself right now is more available to chase, to pour into, to do whatever Spend she needs. Spend quality time with her. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that also allows the woman to fall into the trap of being with this guy, even though he's not really a great guy for her. Mm. Because he's not doing things to provide for her and make sure she's good. But he's keeping her attention. Yes. He is feeding her the attention that she desires and in return, taking her resources. <laughs> so, yeah, in a lot of cases. Yeah, of course. In a lot of cases. <laughs> so with this 50-50 thing, why do you think this is such a big topic, let's say in the last probably 10, 15 years, where it seems like it's 50-50 in the relationship, 50-50 mm -hmm. spending, 50-50 taking care of all responsibilities, 50-50 taking care of the kids. When the woman needs to get up and nurse, the, the, you know, the husband needs to get up and, and be emotional support during that time, mm -hmm. you know share the time taking the kids to school, changing diapers, whatever it is yeah. that, that society is saying. Um, why is this 50-50 thing been so prominent and why does it not work for okay. both men and women? All right, so as far as why it has risen to prominence is again, I think it's this fight for equality. We were fighting so hard and we're losing sight of the bigger picture of balance. Balance is what we need for success, not equality in the relationship. And I would argue that equality in the relationship does not actually exist. Because if you were to examine 50-50 relationships, what you will find is over time, it's going to shift to one person doing more than the other. And I would argue 90% of the time, it's the woman doing more than the guy. Because think about this, the mindset of the man who wants to do 50-50 is, is very different than the man who's so in love with this woman that he wants to provide for her. His willingness to even accept 50-50, he's going to be reluctant to do that. It's kind of like going on a date with a guy and one guy is down to pay Dutch and the other guy's like, don't, don't take your card out. I got this. They already have a very different mindset. So that guy who's opened the 50-50 from the jump, the chances that he's going to change later on and want to take on more is not likely. He's going to get comfortable in that 50-50 or do even less. Also, consider this, even when we say 50-50 on the bills, 50-50 on the bills, in my opinion, would be 20% of your income, 20% of their income. That's not what a lot of people do. The mortgage is, let's say, $1,500, and we split it $750, $750, but the guy, let's just say, makes $80,000, 
The woman makes $40,000. Right. That's not equal. Right. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's making a much bigger sacrifice than he is. Right. So th that alone eliminates this idea that it's 50-50. What that, about the whole raising the kids thing of like, you got to, you know. Exactly. Raising the kids. Now, of course, are there scenarios where sometimes it's the man who ends up doing more? Absolutely. But in most cases, the woman naturally gravitates to being the one who handles the kids more. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to find. So again, you're going to start to see it get skewed in certain areas to where you're not maintaining this 50-50. But then if we go deeper into why this doesn't work. So one, it doesn't work because it doesn't, it's not really sustainable in the vast majority of cases. I'm not saying no one's ever pulled it off. But in majority of cases, it doesn't work. Number two, you know, there was a study that shows, uh, I believe it was a study, that said egalitarian relationships are like the most sexless marriages or the most sexless relationships. Egalitarian meaning like... Equal. 50-50 equal, you know what I'm most saying? sexless. Yes. Why is that? Because basically you're neutralizing the masculine and feminine polarity. The polarity of it. Exactly. It's now just... Neutral. Flat. It's, yeah, it's flat. It's not. There's no excitement there. There's nothing there. It kind of reminds me of this guy. I, I don't want to put him on black. I don't know his name, so I guess I could say it. There was this guy on Twitter. I think it was like late last year, and he posted that he, how his wife just came home from like a 16-hour shift or something crazy like that, and here she is shoveling the snow in the, in the driveway, and how he's so proud of her. Let me get her coffee ready, and the commenters ate him up. Like <laughs> they went in. But, you know, in his mind, it's, we're equal, we're 50-50, look at her doing all these things. But in reality, if a woman has to come home to a man that puts her in that position all the time, doesn't step up, she's going to start to lose attraction. And you're, again, overburdening the woman. What, what a man has to understand, and it's actually mentioned in the book, uh, The Way to Superior Man, yes. where he says, don't make your woman your everything. I think what men underestimate is that women are in their head a lot. They're constantly thinking, constantly processing. So if too much is on her plate, she becomes mentally exhausted, Stressed, mentally worn down. Yes. So when, when the woman says, I'm too tired for sex, the man thinks, well, you weren't doing nothing all day. Her mind was a million different places all day. By the time she got to this moment, she does not have the energy. When the mind goes, the body goes with it. Mm. So when you put too much in front of her, you are taking, her, taking, taking away her ability to thrive in certain areas. So as the book mentioned, you want to identify as a man, what do I need most from her? What's going to be most important for me? Let's now hone in on those things and find someone else to take care of the rest. What are the things that men need most from women in general? What are some of the things? What are the things that you think men need most from women in general? I, I think... In a relationship. Yes. Support. Mm -hmm. Support. And let me add to support by saying a belief in that man. You know, I think we need a woman that believes in us, that kind of reveres us, so to speak, has that respect for us and views us in a great light. Uh, because again, as men, we're going to have moments where we may question ourselves, we may feel down. And if that woman that we're with can't pour into us in that way, in that moment, with a genuine energy of I believe in you, I support you, I love you, that's going to be tough to deal with. All right. I think also sexual satisfaction for most men is extremely important. Um, I, think, I think women underestimate how serious of a need sexual satisfaction is. For a man. Yes. And again, it goes back to not understanding we are wired very differently. By, by biology, looking at it from a biological standpoint, we have more testosterone than they do. Mm -hmm. More sex drive. Exactly. We naturally have more libido. Part of the reason why is because, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, the DNA's main primary objective is reproduction. Yes. It has to keep us ready all the time. And so because of that, that's why... I'm sure you're familiar with semen retention. Tell me. Okay, so semen retention is basically the practice of going without any sexual release mm. over a period of time. Yeah. And people have reported where over time they've developed, like men, they've developed deeper voices, more muscle mass, more confidence, more focus, all these things. By by holding on to the yes, to the by release. holding on to by that life force, so to speak, and not releasing it in any way, shape, or form. Wow. What is happening, I've, from based on my research, what is happening is the body's saying, 
oh, you're not reproducing. We don't need to keep. You're not mating with anybody. I need to make you more desirable. Really? Yes, because I need you to go do something. Wow. So that's why I'm going to raise your testosterone. I'm going to deepen your voice. I'm going to let that masculine energy pop out. You're going to get more confident. You're going to be more comfortable around women. This is what happens. So that's why men who kind of bury themselves in constant sexual release through their own means, they don't understand they're robbing themselves. Now, some people don't believe in it. I'm a huge believer in it. I believe it's absolutely real. And it's extremely beneficial. But back to the point of men and women being so different, it, again, we, we it, and it doesn't mean that there aren't women who need sexual satisfaction as well. And there are women who may be just as sexual as a man. But in general, on average, mm -hmm. a man needs it way more. Biologically speaking, he needs it way more. Mm -hmm. So to neglect him of that, it causes a lot of freaking problems. What happens if a man doesn't have the sexual release and experience and expression in an intimate, committed relationship long term? Well, I think it, it, another thing that it, it can do to you is raise aggression. Because again, with, uh, with the increase of testosterone, aggression also increases. So there was a woman on TikTok who mentioned that we need more monogamy because as monogamy decreases, and less men have a partner that they can mate with and, and be, you know, be sexually engaged with, you'll start to see a rise in rape, you start to see a rise in sexual abuse, you start to see a rise in crime. There's all these negative things that start to happen because you have a group of men who aren't getting any action, who start to get frustrated, and it starts to pour over into negative ways. Now, granted, I don't think we can solve every man getting it or not, but it just speaks to what's happening mm. within a man when he goes without for so long, unless he learns, I, I will say this, because it is possible to also, I believe, to channel that energy into other ways. Yes. So as I mentioned in- uh, Way Superior Man, he talks about Yes, this. and Think and Grow Rich talks about it, uh, yes. sexual, sexual transmutation. transmutation. Yeah. Yes. So I do believe, <laughs> we know about it, so I do I mean, believe. <laughs> the fight of all men yes. have to deal with like managing this energy. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. And so now what happens is if you, are, if you are not an ambitious man or you're not a man that has created avenues for you to release that energy into something more productive, what well, is getting trapped and now that causes a problem. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So you've got to find a way to release it somehow but I think over time, like, we can only sexually transmute so much. <laughs> <laughs> got release at some point. <laughs> so that's just really hard. But again, there's some men who have conquered it better than others. So I'm not going to act like men can't do it. It's just not that easy. What do you think is the best way for a driven, confident, alpha, masculine man, healthy, mm -hmm. conscious, masculine man, to... Eliminate distractions or temptations when they're in a committed, intimate, long-term relationship from wanting to think about other women or scroll on Instagram and, and dream about what that could be like and mm -hmm. be tempted to say, I need more partners. Okay. You know, what is the, you know, what is the best way for men who might feel like, gosh, I just, it's hard for me to hone this in mm -hmm. and stay fully like present with my woman and think about, can I be with this person for 50 years and only be with one person? What is the best solution for those men who might be, maybe women are so attracted to them because they are a desirable man. Yeah. They have a great partner, a great life, great relationship, that women are just trying to come in and steal them. Yeah. <laughs> How does a man stay fully present in their relationship, fully integrous, fully committed for the long-term vision while being present now? You have to cut off everything that feeds the struggle. Mm. So if you know looking at Instagram puts you in that place, you can't be on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's easier said than done depending on a person's profession and all these different things, but literally you have to cut off all influences that push you on that path because it could be Instagram. It could be the music you're listening to. It could be the TV that you're watching depending on what you're watching. And I know it. It's tough because you get to a point where it's like, well, I, I got cut off everything almost. But yeah, yeah. The, the more you can remove these outside influences, the easier it is for you to be present with your partner. I remember one time there was a guy, uh, his wife had got pregnant. I don't know if she, they were married at that time. Either way, his partner was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She put on some weight. 
he found himself less attracted to her. They weren't having sex as much. He went to get some help. They suggested stop looking at porn, stop looking at Instagram. He stopped. For three weeks, he looked at pretty much no other woman unless he passed a woman in the street. He said after three weeks, he found himself more attracted to his partner. Wow. Even without the weight loss. Now, it doesn't mean she, he still didn't want her to lose weight because right. sustaining that, it was still going to have to make some adjustments. But it did help. Interesting. Because he didn't have these other influences constantly being put in his face that makes him question, okay, what's going on here? Like, I don't like this. Or, mm -hmm. you know, dang, I could have this too. Or, you well, know. know what that would be like. Exactly. Man. So it's just... We've got to know our weaknesses our, and where we fall short and just cut it off at the root as best as possible. I think it goes back to also communicating your, your needs, um, you know, your agreements, your roles, responsibilities in the relationship and making sure your needs are met as a man. Yes. If your needs are not met and... You, and it opens the door. It, you're like, oh, okay, I, if, not, if I can't get it here, then I wonder what that would be like or this would be like. Yes. That's why I think it's really important to have these real honest conversations before you get committed about what your needs are. Absolutely. Maybe there's a man that's like, oh, I only need to have sex a couple times a month and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. For me, that doesn't work, yeah. right? <laughs> and you know, maybe in 20 years it changes. I don't know, but yeah. it's like, you gotta be realistic and say, you know, I've had conversations with Martha where I'm just like, this is what I'm gonna need. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm gonna need. And are you able to, to provide this? Yeah. If not, I don't want to push you on something that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, And same for you. What are your needs? And can I provide those for you? Absolutely. And if I can't provide for your needs, you shouldn't be with me. We shouldn't be together. If it doesn't naturally align, yes. right? We should be naturally aligning. Not You have to change three things about you in order to please me, and I have to change everything to please you. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the right match. No, it's not. There might be sexual attraction. There might You maybe have fun. You could be friends, whatever. But... I'm talking healthy, long-term commitment Yeah. with the least amount of pain. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like a, there's going to be challenge. There's going to be adversity and pain that causes by living life. Mm -hmm. But if you can minimize stress and anxiety within the relationship, I think that's the best approach. Absolutely. And talking about needs is key up front. So I'm hearing you say men need to eliminate any temptation or distractions that might get them thinking about another option. Yes. And I do what, agree what with you 100%. As the next thing would be <clears throat> making sure we lay out those needs and desires and make sure they're being met on both sides. Because I'm a firm believer, you can't expect this person to meet all your requirements if you're not going to do the same for them. But I do think that there's a lot of men who, they don't take it as far as they need to as far as expressing what is it exactly you want from this Even woman to weird, be happy. Even the weird, crazy, yes. sexual, like nuances like exactly. you gotta go there yes even if it's uncomfortable or you feel like man this is they're gonna judge me or they're gonna think this is weird mm -hmm. but if you don't get that you're gonna resent it in a year two years six months exactly right? and, and then be thinking about where can i get this met and, and that's a, and that's the key if you can honestly say if i don't get this i'm good like i i would like this but it's not a big deal to me i can go without right, it right. cool but if you know going without this is going to disturb you and be a huge struggle for you, yeah, you're, you're asking for problems. Why do you think it's so hard for mm -hmm. men to only be with one woman or one woman? Or why do you think that's the struggle for men when they think about it? Like, can I only be with one woman for the rest of my life? And they're like, <clears> well, <throat> if I could just have like a threesome once a year, like it would all be, <laughs> you know, we hear these conversations, but why is it challenging? And from the men that you've met who are extremely sexually satisfied with their one intimate partner mm -hmm. for decades, what is it they're doing differently or how have they shifted that thinking that they need more women? So here's my current theories and beliefs <laughs> that I'm not going to lie to you, I still struggle with in some points, not because I don't believe what I'm about to say, but because if true, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. So... <clears throat> I'm of belief that the majority of men can actually be happy with one woman, no problem. I view it in the same way I view business, all right? There's the bosses and the workers, and, and neither label is a negative to either side, okay? It's just a reality that <clears throat> there are men who, they don't need a bunch, they don't need a lot in their life. If they're making a certain salary, they have a roof over their head, food on their table, 
needs are being met, they're good. They don't have this extra gear of ambition that says go out and do more. Mm -hmm. That kind of guy can have his one woman. Again, key is needs are being met. In the relationship. Yes, in the relationship. I think he's fine. He can do that for the rest of his life, no problem. Live a happy, fulfilled life. Yes. And, and understand, because that man doesn't even have the desire in him or the energy to go out there yeah. trying to mingle with other women and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. A lot of effort. Yes. It takes a certain kind of mindset and energy to be able to do that. A lot of guys aren't like that. They just want to be happy and have their needs met, and that's it. But then there's the smaller percentage of men, which we could argue are the more desirable men of society, who tend to be more ambitious men. Like, I remember reading somewhere, if if I'm correct, people like Einstein, Steve Jobs, all these geniuses, high sexual energy. Mm. There seems to be this connection, this correlation between these ambitious men, these these very unique individuals that do big things in life, and them having this very high sexual energy. And again, they probably had to learn to transmute some of that to, to accomplish what they accomplished. Where these types of men there's a greater struggle now Mm -hmm. to just be limited to that one woman because it's the same thing that they struggle with being limited to one invention or one business. You know what I'm saying? They they just have this mind and this this desire for more. I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. And so I think that guy is the guy that, I don't know if it's maybe his testosterone is higher than normal, I don't know. I don't know what is it in the man that causes that. But I do believe that every highly ambitious, successful man I know, the vast majority, so let me not say every, but the vast majority of them have that struggle or don't even believe in monogamy, period. (laughs) All right? Okay, finish what you're saying. Yeah, so, so, and and I will say some of the ones who have, like, I feel for me personally, the thing that helps me is my relationship with God. Yeah. If I take that away, oh, I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you're a dog. <laughs> it's a rat. Without God, you're a dog. <laughs> yeah, it's a rat. Like, I, and, and and let me just be clear: not dog as in I would never be a liar. Right, I'll right, never right. be playing women, taking nah, advantage nah. of them. None of that. But would I be all over the place? It's Potentially. A, yeah. Devon Franklin talks about this in one of his books uh, about there's a dog in every man, mm. right? Again, not like a. A mean dog, but like a yeah. dog that has like a desire to go get another bone out there. Yeah. You know? It's like just like, and it's learning how to fight the dog within you mm-hmm. that has that desire, right? What happens, have you ever met a man who's been in a, a marriage, let's say, or a long-term relationship with one person as a constant, but has other sexual encounters with other women and the relationship works long-term? with that one person still. Open relationship or hall passes that are aware of this, the partner's aware of this, Mm -hmm. where you still have this really happy, intimate, connected partnership between the man and the main partner. Have you met anyone like this? No, honestly. What typically happens when a man is with someone but also is with other people? Yeah, so I think, one, we have to make sure we define what work means. So to some people, it's working because they're still together. I mean, happy, healthy. Exactly. Like, That's the fulfilled. key. So for that to be the the standard of what we call it's working, no. Um, you haven't seen that. I haven't seen it. I'm not. You know, I can never say it doesn't exist 100. percent But what I think is, what I believe strongly is that the woman accepting that is already kind of killing off a piece of herself. That piece that wants to be number one in his life, that wants to be fully loved, to feel like he doesn't need anyone else but me. And I argue that, kind of going back to masculine and feminine, to show you another difference between men, women need love at a level or in a way that men don't. Meaning that if you went to a woman and you said, or if you went to a man and you said, I will give you this woman, she will give you everything that you need, be fulfill all your desires, but she cannot say she's in love with you. Will you take it? There's a majority of men who will take it. Because, hey, I'm They'll getting my needs met. Yeah. yeah, I'm good. Well, who cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you go to a woman with the same deal, he will fulfill all your needs. He'll be everything that you want, but he cannot say he is in love with you. There's a lot of women who can't take that deal. Really? Yes. Why is that? 
because again, they need that aspect of love, that energy that it's, it's, it takes things to a different level that speaks to who they are. I believe that speaks to the feminine in the woman. The feminine in the woman craves that love. Mm. We are more in, you, you can call it the more logical mind or whatever you want to call it, but we just want, as long as we get what we need, it's and we easier feel for us. Yes, we feel respected and, and, and we're being satisfied. A lot of guys are like, I'm not passing that up. I can never encourage someone to remain in a toxic situation. Mm -hmm. All right. I do think that we can take an approach that says, let's see if we can work this out. Let's give them a little bit of grace here. And the main thing is, can we achieve progress? All right. Rome isn't built in a day. And if we've been behaving or we've been tolerating this dysfunction for so many years, yeah. <laughs> we can't expect it to be perfect tomorrow. But are you willing to at least start to walk on that path mm. and make progress? Though I don't want to encourage divorce, I don't. I, I cannot feel comfortable telling people to stay trapped in a marriage with someone who doesn't want to face their issues. Right. If you have freed yourself from that, you have healed, they've got to be willing to make a move. And here's the problem. People, people are afraid to heal or people are afraid to face the issues that requires them to heal, all right? Because you have to, it's like, I, I remember a quote, and I'm probably saying it wrong. To heal, you have to face the pain or you have to dive into the pain, something like that, all right? So people understand it's painful to go and revisit your past. It's painful to let those emotions you've suppressed all these years come back out. And so now your fear of healing or facing the process of healing is greater than your fear of losing this person. All right. And they think because you're married to them, you're not going anywhere. You're stuck for life. Exactly. So for that reason, there that's not enough incentive to face their fear of facing their issues. Wow. The only thing that may get them to do it is the threat of divorce. Wow. It, or is the actual divorce happening? Again, I, it's not that I want it to get to that point. I hope and pray everyone can avoid that. But the reality is some people won't get it together until there's a real consequence on the table. And that will be divorce in that situation. So, okay. Let's say someone's like, you know what? I feel like I'm good. It's never been about me. It's been about everyone else. It's their problems that why the relationship doesn't Hold work Hold on, I gotta out. stop you real quick. Yes. Because this is like hitting my spirit, I gotta Give say. Give it to me. The other thing to consider is that some people will never change. They will never heal. And the reality is that the person you're with is the wrong person. And the only reason you got with them is because you were broken. <laughs> Had you not been damaged in the first place, Zing. you may not be with this individual. Because you wouldn't have chose someone like this if you were coming from a healed place. Exactly. And if you were healed, ah. you would have been your true self. Your true self ah. may not have aligned with this individual. Ah. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't um, circumstances where people still end up with the right person when they were both not healed. I do think that's possible to happen. But a lot of people, wow. I would argue the majority, when you, because I always say, if you're not healed, you are 99% likely to choose the wrong person. So Ooh, I do still strongly believe that the majority of people are with the wrong individual. And that's marriage, relationship, whatever. Because that brokenness, that damage- Attracted something else that exactly, was Exactly, and allowed you to tolerate it. Or it allowed you to feel safer in that environment. Wow. Here's the thing that people don't realize. When, when you have not healed, if you were to get with a healthy person, it would essentially demand of you from the jump to basically heal or step your game up. And again, people are afraid to face their issues. So to get with another broken person, subconsciously, uh, it validates me staying broken. It validates me mm. not having to face my issues because now we all have issues. You right, see, right. as long as we all have issues, I don't have to face mine. But if you have corrected yours, how can I validate my own? Wow. What's your issues? My issues? <laughs> the, co the coach always has an issue somewhere. <laughs> Um, What's your biggest fear or insecurities around being in a relationship or finding the right person or dating or? So, okay, I, I'll say fear. And I just, I'm being very transparent. Give I've never said this I anywhere know you else. All right? I know you haven't. Your biggest fear. My biggest fear has been, can I remain focused and, and fulfilled in the relationship long term past a certain time? Meaning, okay, I, I have no doubts five years in. 
10 years in, I'm still good. But when it hits year 15, this is different. Can't, and, and again, it's, it, I, it's because of, one, I think a lot of people, the issue that we have, is specifically even with monogamy, not saying that I'm going to be going out there cheating, but I always say the issue with monogamy is that people struggle to maintain monogamy. Mm-hmm. And we struggle to maintain monogamy because we don't maintain who we fell in love with. All right? What do you mean by that? Meaning that person that I brought you and you brought to me that made us feel like this is it. It's different. It's different now. The thing is, though, it can be maintained if it's the true you. Problem is a lot of people aren't being their true self on the jump. Right, right. So that creates a difference right there. Also, is there a willingness to grow together? Mm-hmm. And that create that needs communication. That means connection has to be there. A lot of people have not gotten with that person they have a connection with. So this is where, for me, there's fear, but there's peace in knowing that I do believe if I'm willing to do my part to maintain who, who she falls in love with, all right? Whoever that woman is, when that day happens... I'm willing to do that. And that goes spiritually, mentally, physically. I have no problem sticking to the recipe that worked. And, I, and I'm and i confident in one end because I say, you know what? I believe in connection. And I believe that that's the missing ingredient. When I look at these relationships that have failed and haven't made it past that 10-year, 15-year mark, I do think that the reason is connection was not there so in com- most cases. So, so chemistry was there... Chemistry may have been there at, at one at point. First. Compatibility. Yes. Compatibility based on what they were presenting at one point may have been there. But again, was it true compatibility right, if they weren't real. being their true self? And if they had not found their true self yet. Um, but connection was not there. And I think a lot of people get with each other based off the hype. And that's the reason why I'm such a stickler on, okay, I have to make sure I wait for connection because I want to make it past those 15 years. I want to make it for the long haul. I, I want to be a representation of what I speak about. I, I want people to look at my relationship and say, I, I don't want it to be that fake relationship that people think is good, right. but it's actually horrible behind closed doors. No, I want it to be amazing to everyone and inspire them. So I have to wait for connection and me being a man of God, I have to wait for that spiritual guidance that says, this is the one that I can pray about this. And God tells mm. me she's it. Because, you know, there's a lot of beautiful, amazing women out there, but everyone's not for us. Right. And so I think it's important to understand who aligns with you, especially as a man when you're walking in your purpose. And that's why it's so important for men to find their purpose, because if you don't know where you're headed in life, you don't know who belongs on that path with you. So you've got to make sure that you know yourself, you know the direction you're walking in, and now you can see what woman can align with you and you guys can walk together as a unit and make it something amazing. Mm. What's your definition of chemistry, connection, and compatibility? All right. So <laughs> chemistry to me is, is the art of getting along, flowing with each other. All right. Chemistry can be created. It can be destroyed. Think about it from a team sports perspective. You can put players together and they have to build team chemistry. So through repetition, through practice, they can get to a point of having chemistry. Yes, some people have instant chemistry, all right? But just as it was instant, it can also be broken. Instantly. Um, Exactly. (laughs) You know, we can start to not get along and not flow with each other very easily. Uh, Things can get in the way. And again, this happens even in team sports or Mm -hmm. even in the corporate arena where you have team building exercises. But then things happen that destroy the structure Mm -hmm. of the business. Absolutely. So that's chemistry. That's chemistry. How important is chemistry? It is still very important. It is not the most important. And I say that to mean chemistry has to be in every relationship for it to work and flourish. But it does not set the stage for everything else, all right? Connection sets the stage for everything else. So basically, if you have connection, you will be able to have chemistry and compatibility. But now, let's talk about compatibility. I believe compatibility is a very logic-based structure of putting two people together. It's also about we're compatible in the sense that we share values, all right? So again, you can meet someone that you are quote unquote compatible with. You guys share similar values. You guys come from even maybe the same kind of cultures. There could be a lot of things that make you guys compatible on paper. Uh Uh-huh. But But what is is real compatibility? Well, to me, that is real compatibility, so to speak, is, is that yes, you guys on paper are a good fit, all right? And you guys should work. But again, 
without connection, it won't matter. So I would argue that a lot of marriages, let's even talk about arranged marriages. Some of them were built on compatibility. Well, this person came from the right family, so we, we like this, they have a good job, they have a good education, they would be a good fit here. They share the same values. But when those two people are really alone with each other, it doesn't always hit. Which is why if you go on an online dating site, it can match two people together that are compatible on paper. Interesting. But in person, it doesn't always play out the same. Because what is missing? The, it, the chemistry or more importantly, the connection. And sometimes we might be tricked. Oh, we feel the spark of chemistry, but you may not have connection. Is that true? It, absolutely. Absolutely. So you might say, oh, we're compatible on paper, everything. We have the same values. We want the same things for our life and marriage mm -hmm. and kids and where family is going to be. We have compatibility. We have chemistry. There's some type of spark here. Mm -hmm. I feel like, ooh, there's a little something down here. That yeah, makes we, feel and like we get special. along and we know yeah. how to flow with each wow, other. It's amazing. But you're saying if we can't find true connection or if there isn't connection, can connection be created? No. And so that's the that's the huh. huge distinction to me with connection. Connection cannot be created nor can it be destroyed. It's either there or it's not. Wow. There's nothing you can do to build connection. You can build a stronger bond. You can uh, create a stronger attachment to each other, but that still doesn't mean connection is there. And, and you see this play out in situations where you have people who could ha meet each other right now, have this amazing connection. Something happens where they fall apart. They come back together years later, 10, 20 years later, and it's like they never stop talking. It just falls right back into place. It's connection. It's a deeper thing that's occurring there. Mm. To me, connection is your spirit recognizing its match. It is something that is happening beneath the surface, all right? Which is why many people who have felt connection, you can't always explain it. Connection does not always line up with the logic of compatibility. It's not always, oh, well, it makes sense because of this. No, 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 no. It's just there. You just feel something with this person. You feel drawn to them. It's so much deeper than anything you've ever felt. And, and consider this. You can be compatible with tons of people. You can have chemistry with tons of people. You do not feel connection with a bunch of people, period. If we were to survey people who have felt a connection in their life, you'd be lucky to find many who can say two times. Wow. The majority will say it's a one-time occurrence that has happened to them, all right? And, and, and being able to have that again, it's very difficult. Now, I don't want anyone listening to be discouraged if they did not end up with the person they had a connection with. I'm not saying it's impossible for it to happen a second time. But I will say that if you surveyed people, you would have a wow. hard time finding that many people that say it said it happened twice. When does someone know it's connection and not chemistry? Because I feel like you might be tricked. We have this incredible connection. We understand each other. We get each other. I can't explain it, but I feel something. That feeling might be also chemistry at the same time, right? Yes. It might be masking. Yes if it's really connection or chemistry. So how do you know if it's true connection over, man, this is desire, connection, attraction, all these things happening at once? One, can you truly be yourself with Ooh, this person? Ooh, that's big. All right? Because again, a lot of people, they go on these dates, they're bringing their representative, and the chemistry happens on a surface level with the representatives that both sides are bringing. But when you actually show your true self, <laughs> now what happens? And a lot of people have not done that with their partner or the person that they're getting to know. So again, you're falling into the hype of the chemistry or the compatibility, but you're not discovering true connection being there. So you've got to be able to be yourself because real connection loves you at the core. Mm. All right. You can show me all the parts of you. I still want you. All right. Number two is can we enjoy each other with no distractions? All right. Again, what people fail to understand, and this can happen with chemistry, is that we're, we're bonding based off of the activity mm -hmm. or the, the, the things in our environment. Meaning, all right, we, we love going out together and we do all these fun stuff and we're doing all these things. And that's great, all right? We know how to have fun together. But can we be alone in a room, no TV, no distraction, no phone, just us and still love being with each other. Mm. A lot of people can't say that. A lot of people are only able to be in their relationship and tolerate their partner. And I use that word strongly, tolerate their partner because they have enough distractions in their life. They have kids, they have work, 
They, they have all these other things TV, going video on. video games, man caves, exactly. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. All these things that pull them away from their partner. That does not allow them to face the fact that, no, you really don't like each other at their core. Man. And, and so that is a huge sign of connection. That's why, like, one thing I suggested in one of my books was go on a road trip. And, and it's just a random suggestion, but go on a road trip for at least six hours, no phone, no distraction, just you and them talking. Will you still be happy after those six hours? A lot of people can't make it that far in a car ride with their partner. All right. A lot of people cannot be in a room with, alone with their partner and nothing else to take their attention. So you've got to you got to really push those boundaries to see what do we really have here if this is really going to be called a connection. Right. And your fear is. Are you able to grow together after 10, 15 years? Is that one of the main things? Is it, so so is it, it's it's you know, it's hard to you know, you never you never can look that far ahead. You know, and we don't know what's in store. You may not be here tomorrow. Exactly. It's it's a concern of can we still give that same energy? And it's both sides. Because again, I, I'm not saying I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm confident that I could do it, what if there's something that throws me off? You know, it's just that, yes, it, as time goes on, there's that test of really putting your best foot and bringing that that same energy that you brought in the beginning. Now, again, I think I'm holding myself to a higher standard that I think most people do because I think that a lot of people's mentality is, well, things change. Things are going to be different. It's okay. So what? You don't go out as much anymore. People think like this, mm -hmm. but they don't realize that's why your relationship is deteriorating. Right. I don't want a deteriorated relationship. So when I think about, yes, can I be with someone past 10, 15 years? If I accept a level of mediocrity, of course. But <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> exactly. I'm saying, can we maintain excellence mm -hmm. after these 10, 15 Fulfillment, years? Exactly. Fun, play, Peace, and, yeah. happiness, joy, all these things. Because to me, what is the point of being here if we don't have it, if we're not operating at our That's highest true. level? What about what about the saying that I hear, whether this is a meme or this is women saying this online? Maybe you know the line better than me. <laughs> uh, if he can't accept me at my worst, he doesn't deserve me at my best. I hate that line. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely hate it. And I hate it because it, it, it has turned into validation for not addressing your flaws and issues. Mm. All right? I agree with it from the standpoint of you've got to be able to handle your partner's worst moments. All right, because we're gonna all have moments. We're gonna all fall. We're all gonna do make a mistake. It's gonna happen over time. It, that's just the way it is. But when you are essentially trying to say, "I have a horrible flaw, and you should accept it," even when I want to consistently make you deal with it, no, that's not gonna work for me. Yeah, that's I can't accept that. That's yeah. not that's not okay. And so a lot of people, that's what they're turning it into. That's it's, you not taking accountability and responsibility exactly, for growth. Exactly. It's going back to, uh, okay, this is where I'm at. I don't want to address it. You just have to accept it and or don't be with me. Exactly. You know, it reminds me of like, once upon, I don't know if they still say it, but I know at one time people would say arguing is healthy for a relationship. All right? I despise I don't know that. If I, I don't know if I agree. I, I understand that. Yeah, I just don't like that. No, at all. Can you can you communicate with with we don't agree on this, but do you have to argue? Exactly. That's my thing. Disagreement is acceptable. Disrespect is not. Ooh. All right? So Say it one more time. Disagreement is acceptable. Disrespect is not. That's good. All right? So my thing is, yes, it's okay and, and even healthy to have disagreements because we have different perspectives. We can bounce ideas off each other. We simply have to know how to navigate that and come to an official decision on things when we have those moments. But arguing, arguing says we are being disrespectful. Whether our tone is negative, the words that we're using, you know, we're getting loud, we're getting angry. We're, our, we're basically throwing negative energy at our partner. That's not healthy. There's nothing healthy about that. But a lot of people will say that because they want to validate the unhealthiness in their relationship. They don't want to mm, face the issue of, man. I need to learn how to talk to my partner better. I don't want to have to fix my tone. Why do I have to watch what I say? Because that's what an adult does. Wow. All right, grow up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. like I'm sorry to anyone listening to this, but that's just real. We, we can't just think it's okay, especially with our partners, 
to speak however we want, to, to, to throw all kinds of insults, to be disrespectful and think this is okay. Because what people are not realizing is all it takes is that one really bad argument to plant a seed of negativity that now grows into something worse in the relationship. A lot of people's issues are not the issue that they're facing in that current moment. It's the culmination of all kinds of things before then. It's the buildup from that last time you disrespected me <laughs> or made me feel some kind of way. And ever since then, I've resented you. And now in this resentment, I've given you an attitude. You didn't know what the attitude was about because I didn't communicate clearly. Mm -hmm. Now you're giving me attitude. And now you see how it turns into other things. Now that attitude turns into not having sex with each other. That attitude turns into, okay, uh, the way that we talk to each other in, in general. Maybe being coming secretive because now we don't feel like dealing with each other anymore. And what you don't realize is it started from disrespectful arguing. Wow. All right? It could also start from some other stuff. All right? But arguing is a huge problem for a lot of people, and we can't just keep sweeping under the rug. So going back to your point about the whole uh, take me as my, at my worst, yes, Worst moment. <laughs> you not, can have not a moment. Always like this. Yeah, and once in a while, a good attitude. Exactly. Consistent negative behavior has to be addressed and corrected. So arguments are disrespect, but disagreements is okay. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, disagreement is acceptable. Disrespect yeah. is not. Yes. So you can always disagree and you can agree to not agree. Yeah. Or you can, is that right? Agree to disagree. Yeah, agree to disagree. <laughs> but you. But what I'm hearing you say is that arguing, uh, saying what's on your mind in an angry, exactly. aggressive way, uh, tearing down a partner is never going to do anything good for someone. Exactly. People have to understand, whenever someone feels attacked, they will defend themselves. Even if they know they're wrong, even if the point you're making is actually solid, the way you're coming at them negates their ability to receive it. That's why even me as a speaker, my focus has been, do I want to be heard or do I want people to receive my message? Mm -hmm. All right. If I want to be heard, I can speak however I want. I can be blatant with the insults. I can cut people down. I can just you know, make jokes of everybody's situation because it's just entertainment. I just want to be heard. But no, I want people to receive it. And if I want people to receive it, I have to be more considerate more compassionate. I have to check my tone. I have to be careful with my words. And that's why if people watch my videos, they'll see I try to be very careful with my words because I want you to receive mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So if we're in a relationship, we have to take that approach. If you want them to hear you, be mindful of how you're talking to them. Why is this so hard for people? Because again, they don't they don't want to face the the, the or they don't want to do the work of correction. All right? And the work of correction can entail the healing, and again, facing those issues. Um, it's also conditioning. If people have been brought up in households and environments where this is how they talk to each other, it's it's very it's hard to change. Yeah, that, yeah. It, it's foreign to now speak in a more loving and positive way. <laughs> it's foreign to sit and be quiet and listen. All right. So now they have to reprogram themselves, and that's a lot of work. Um, and and I think also the acceptance of the way you're communicating is wrong. Mm. People don't like to face that they were wrong. It, it, they don't want to have to accept that. So it's, no, I have to dig an even deeper hole and, 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 and stick with this whole negative approach of how I do things because, no, they, they, there's nothing wrong with this. Or I see other people do it, but, you know, they're fine. No, they're not fine. They're not okay. You know? So I think those reasons, just overall, they don't want to have to do the work. And so they rather make excuses for it. So it sounds like, again, we go back to step one, healing. Always. If you can learn to heal, you can start to improve the quality of your choices, dating someone in a relationship or getting out quicker. You can be an, a better, uh, more effective communicator in relationships, whether you're dating or in a, in a long-term committed relationship. You can have uh, a better relationship overall with yourself when you heal and with someone else. So can you give me a a breakdown, a boot camp 101 on how to recognize what you need to heal and then how to start healing that. Okay. What does that look like for someone? Okay, I need to heal, Stefan. <laughs> what do you mean by that? How do I do it? How do I get started? How long does it take to get healed? Okay. Is this a lifelong journey? Is this overnight? What does it look like? All right, so first thing, how long does it take to heal? It's going to take as long as you're willing to put in the work. Oh. Healing is not a time thing. It's a work thing. 
So when you hear people say time heals all wounds, no, it doesn't. Time alone doesn't heal a damn thing. All right. It can help. It, it does aid in the process. But by itself, it is no good. You have to take certain steps. Um, so when people think, well, I'm going to take a year off from relationships to heal. Why a year? And, and if you're not doing the work in that year, that year means nothing. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They took a year off, but what they did was they hid from the world. They hid from relationships. They went in their corner, all right, and distracted themselves, but they never healed. Now they come back out of that year, and they're still the same person. Mm. Or maybe they're not the same. Maybe the first few months of dating, they're a little different, but then they fall back in. Exactly, the because they never resolve things right. at its core. Now... In terms of recognizing what to heal, uh, my first step is is called the who hurt me list, all right? So you get a piece of paper, you write down the piece of paper, who hurt me? And now every person who comes to mind, you write them down on the piece of paper. Uh, it doesn't matter how long ago it happened, doesn't matter if you think you've moved past it, if you think it's not relevant, if they come to mind, then there's some level of relevance there. Put them on the paper in about a sentence or two of what they did to hurt you, all right? This is how we're going to start to locate what you've been holding on to. But you really got to go into this exercise very genuine. You can't be trying to control the narrative. You just got to let yourself feel. Just ask yourself the question, close your eyes, let it come out. What's the question they should ask? Who hurt, Who hurt me? me? That's it. Who Over hurt me? Over. That's it. And what if they're like, ah, I can only think of like three people that really hurt me. Should they be thinking of like every instant they can think of from childhood of that one comment? Or should this be... This person punched me in the face. Anybody who comes to mind. Anyway. So I don't want them to force it, but I don't want them to under, undermine it in any kind of way either. Just whoever comes to mind, put them on the paper. Because even if there's a situation where you forgot somebody, if we tackle the big one, you're not going to be able to escape the big ones. The big ones are going to come out. They're right. going to come to mind. Right. If we can tackle those, then that might set the stage where everything else gets taken care of naturally. Sure, sure, All sure. All right? Because now your awareness is going to be there and your level of healing will allow you to see things differently. Because really the big ones might be the ones that cause the most pain. And if you heal that, the other ones are just a pattern of the pain. Exactly. Yeah. And you will also start to perceive those situations differently once you've healed from the bigger ones. Okay, so that's step one. Take, take a piece of paper, write it out. How long should this take? A few minutes, a few hours, depending? Depending on the person because, you know, for some people it's going to get heavy. Yeah. It's going to get heavy and that might cause them to want to pause and take a step back. But I would encourage them, do not like walk away from it completely. Stick to it. But it can be as quick as a few minutes. Maybe it takes an hour because may, it, they may get emotional in the process. Mm -hmm. But just don't run from it. In a relationship that's you've been together for a long time, we've been married together for a long time, and it just feels like it's not working. And you're talking about divorce, and both of you aren't happy, but you've got the kids, you've got the home, you've got the lives together, mm -hmm. and both of you aren't happy, right? And you've like addressed this and talked about it. You've tried different things, they haven't worked maybe. Is there a way to rekindle those three things and find that connection again? Maybe, maybe you've lost that attraction and that balance. Uh, is that even possible in these times or is divorce the only way to, to, try, to then go find true happiness or mm -hmm. connection somewhere else? If a true connection ever existed in that relationship, then it can be fixed. Mm. But that's the key. Did it ever really exist? And we've got to examine that because, again, yeah. many people have been living off the fantasy of their perception of things, what they wanted to believe it was. And, and wanting to hold on to this feeling of being in love, but in reality, they were involved in an unhealthy attachment to this mm -hmm. individual. So we have to go deeper and find out, is that there? So if the uh, connection was there, yes, we can work on everything else. We can get things on track. It's going to, cause a, it's going to create a lot of uh, deeper emotional discovery, so to speak, as far as finding out, okay, why is there a disconnect now? How do we fall off of track? How can we now correct these specific things? Because there's very specific things that need to change. Are we both willing to put in that work? All right. And if, if both sides are willing to do that, then it absolutely can work. Now, if there was no connection, you're a divorce. Get a divorce? Get a divorce. They, Sooner than I'm, later. I'm a man of God and I would love for everyone to be able to stay married, right? But I'm even very, when even when people have been convinced that you get married, you stay married forever. This, even if it's a religious thing or you feel like the pressure of society. like Here's why 
Despite those things, you don't stay married, especially when you have kids. So, so many people stay wow. married because of the kids, right? Yeah. But if you can't create a positive environment at home, you are damaging the kids worse than you would in divorce. Divorce isn't, in my opinion, the greatest struggle for the child. It's, the, it's lacking the understanding of what just happened here. So if you've been feeding your kids all these years that mommy and daddy love each other and everything's all good, despite our dysfunctional why are we getting relationship. Divorced? Yeah. Exactly. So now one day you wake up, we're getting divorced. The child is confused. And the thing is, we're not honest with the kids about why this happened, what went wrong. We're not saying, yeah, you know what? We knew a long time ago we weren't best <laughs> no. for each other. We're not giving them the honest truth for them to learn and not make the same mistakes Repeat in there. The pattern. Exactly. What the child now thinks is you can't trust love. Wow. You can't trust marriage because you can love each other and one day now it's over. And now they become dysfunctional or they now have dysfunctional relations because of their skewed perception of things because they lack clarity in understanding what just happened here. But going back to divorce versus staying together, again, what a child needs more than anything is a positive loving environment. If you can achieve that together, great. If you can't, you are better off apart. Wow. Because when you speak to adults now, adults who are struggling today grew up in dysfunctional households. And it didn't <laughs> yeah, matter if it was a one-parent or two-parent household. Yeah, I felt it, man. Exactly. Dysfunction is dysfunction. Yeah. And we pick up on these things. No one is that great of an actor that they're hiding it from their child. The child sees the problem. Feels it. Feels, feels it. Exactly. And then you don't even realize... You neglect the child in certain ways because you're dwelling in your own issues, your own uh, struggle. Mm. There are women right now who have mommy issues or they have what I call I don't want to be my mother syndrome where they saw their mother allow herself to be treated poorly, abused, suffered through a horrible marriage. And the woman is like, I don't want to ever be that. And now because she's holding on to that, she either becomes her mother or creates other issues not trying to be her. All right. So it still creates a negative cycle of dysfunctional relationships, mm. all stemming from we stayed longer than we should have. We try to hold on to something that we can't work. My thing is this, even for those who are spiritual, if you're going to say we're not supposed to get divorced because of God. Well, God didn't say act a fool in the marriage at the same time. Like, what's the point like of staying miserable. together? Exactly. How are you glorifying God or your spiritual beliefs by staying in a negative marriage for the sake of staying? You're defeating the purpose. The purpose is to have a healthy, happy union, mm. to raise healthy, happy children. If we can't achieve that together, it's time to go. Wow. I, I, I mean, I wish it could be different, but that's just the reality of the world we live in because too many of us have made the wrong decision in who we marry. And we have to accept that. I'd rather you accept that now, go through your healing process, and both of you can find your happiness and learn how to coexist as uh, co-parents. And again, creating a positive environment in that co-parenting relationship. Because I don't want you to be co-parents and Negative. still be dysfunctional. Yeah. Exactly. Again, defeating the purpose. <laughs> All right. I, I want you to get away from each other so you can find happiness, not be more negative. Yeah. Heal. So, move forward. Yeah. Exactly. Be happy. Be happy for them if they found someone else. I know that's tough for a lot of people. Right, yeah. But be happy if they're at peace. You find your peace. Let the children see happy, healthy relationships, not just with other people, within yourself. Wow. Stop showing them a miserable father or mother. They see it and they hold on to resentment. I, I can't tell you how many, um, I won't say every, but I want to say 90% of clients that I've seen, and I would argue that if you spoke to any therapist or coach out there, the majority of people have issues stemming from their parents growing up in that household. Yeah. Or their, their environment. Exactly. You know, their parents or their environments. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just all <clears> the <throat> dysfunctional relationship. Relationships right. is the backbone of society. When we allow that to be as dysfunctional as it is right now, that's the reason why we have all these problems. Yeah. We fix that. Man, this world becomes a hundred times better place to yeah. live. Yeah. Easily. More loving, more peaceful, more yes. enjoyable. Happy people supportive. all around doing horrible, yeah. negative things. All right. Exactly. <laughs> when do you when should people uh, you know, when do they know that okay, we just need to work on things in our marriage or relationship? Like not every marriage is gonna be perfect all the time and happy. Like there's gonna be some dysfunction or challenges or issues that arise. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully you've addressed all those things, but let's say you've set expectations early. You both understand these things before you got married, like you communicated everything and you're aligned to a certain vision for your marriage. Mm -hmm. Five years goes down the line and 
it seems like things are getting worse and worse. Maybe expectations change, maybe values change, who knows what it is. Mm -hmm. When do you know like, okay, it's getting too far or we should stay in this relationship? When should we get divorced or should or we should keep trying? To me, the first sign that we have problems is that when whatever is going on in our marriage is affecting me in a way that I can't be the best husband or wife I need to be, we got a problem. That's step number one. I think what's happened is we've normalized this function too much. Uh-huh. We've normalized this idea that we're going to all have problems. Yeah, but we all have problems because we don't learn how to work through them. Interesting. Because we have dysfunction and individual dysfunction that we have not processed and resolved. And, and the other problem is we expect our partners to be, to be our emotional punching bags. Yeah, our, we think, well, because you love us, you should deal with our crazy moment, yeah. our dysfunction, our disrespect, all these things because, okay, but we show you love in other moments, so don't, don't blame me yeah. for this one. No, like, Focus on giving your partner the best of you, not the worst of you. Yes, they should help you through your struggle. But struggle is not an excuse to blatantly disrespect, stress out, Swear throw out. negativity yeah. at Punch, your partner. Yeah. yeah, you know, that's you can't do that. So I think we have to all hold ourselves accountable to a higher standard of how we behave in our relationships. And yes, stop giving this excuse that well, we're all going to have our dysfunction. No, yeah. listen. It can happen, granted, but we should be focused on, uh-huh. as Will laid out for Jada in that talk, we have to discuss things peacefully. Yes. We have to come to the table calmly, maturely, and see how we can resolve it and not just lash out. That's not healthy. Because screaming is not communicating. No. It's not creating a connection. There's not an attraction there and there's no balance. Exactly. You don't have those three it things. Destroys all of it. it destroys <laughs> all of it. And you know, whenever I have gotten in arguments in the past, in in my relationships all i want to do is go be alone afterwards i'm like i don't want to be around you Mm -hmm. i just want to be alone like i need space to like heal and recover now Mm -hmm. because it's very traumatic or at least it has been for me Mm -hmm. and that's just been my personal experience and i think that's why it's so important to learn how to communicate in a peaceful way and sure you might get frustrated and and tension might come up but you got to create ground rules i think for yourself and your partner what are we gonna do when that happens? Exactly. Maybe we're just quiet until we can breathe mm-hmm. and like communicate calmly. But I don't think there's anything good that comes from screaming. No, not at all. I, I witnessed that with my parents screaming and escalating and it was just like, it never felt good in the house. Mm-hmm. There was nothing that ever came from that that was good. They always had to like apologize to each other in ways and then it was like passive aggressive for a week and it's just like, <laughs> Like, why can't we just be, you know, mm-hmm. more peaceful about these things? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important. It doesn't just affect your relationship. It affects the people that are in your relationship, family, friends. It affects those people yeah, as well. Yeah, it even affects your coworkers because, Absolutely. you know, I'm a firm believer that people take a lot of their relationship issues into the office. And it affects their attitude, their energy, their focus. And they don't realize how they're hurting their efficiency and hurting their ability to do so much more and do so much better, whether they're an entrepreneur or they work for somebody, because their relationship is dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'm a firm believer in if we can help uh, people who work in corporate or whatever have stronger, better relationships, their careers will thrive, their companies will thrive. Like, it, it pours into everything. So we have to create that positivity in our lives so that we can reach our true potential. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think it affects everything in business. I mm-hmm. mean, when you're having a bad relationship intimately, it affects the way you show up yep. in your career, for sure. What's what's uh, one thing you wish men understood more about women in general? Mm. And <laughs> one thing you wish women knew about men in general? All right. Every man and everyone's different. You know, everyone human's different. But in general, based on all the work you've done and the the things you hear over and over again, one thing you wish men knew about women and women knew about men. This may sound bad, but what's coming to, I always just say what comes to mind, all right? Because yeah. I, I never practice any of these things, is learn to look past her words. And what I mean by that is a lot of times, again, women don't always fully express themselves. As much as women will say men are horrible communicators, women are actually horrible communicators. Yeah. Right? And, and it's because, yes, they talk, but they're not always clear. Uh. And part of it is because women can see past our words, all right? Sometimes to the point where they overanalyze and over-rationalize things and it causes them to look at things the wrong way. 
but they know how to pay attention to all the small details. They, they understand if our moods are different, even if we say we're okay, they're very in tune with that. So they kind of have that expectation with us. Mm, yeah. And though I want women to be more clear and transparent, I want men to be more aware and be more in tune with your partner. It's not just about her saying, I'm okay. Look at her, pay attention. Does she show you she's okay? Does she really look like there's no, nothing going on right now? And if you can see past that, I'm not saying badger her because yeah, she might not want to be badgered, but at least one, show a true concern yeah. for her feelings and show that you are going to be there for her when she is ready to let you know and have that talk. Mm -hmm. You want to create a very right. secure environment with your partner, a very safe environment where she can open up to you, she can be herself. And again, I do believe that starts with look past the words and even in understanding yeah. how to keep her satisfied and happy. It's like the woman who says to you, you don't need to buy me anything for my birthday. All right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Don't but, listen to her words. Exactly. Yeah. Look past that. And even if you think she's telling the truth, you know what? There's nothing wrong with doing, still doing a little special something, something for yeah. her. It, it just shows that, again, you're more in tune with what's really going on with her emotionally and not, what, not just what she's speaking. But I do believe that as you do that more often and you show a willingness to hear her out, we have to consider our partner's feelings. I think too many men don't consider their partner's feelings. When you do that, she will become more transparent. Mm. When she knows that she can be open and honest and you're not going to reject how she feels or what she says or call it crazy, she will be more willing to speak up about it. So I do think women, I mean, men need to be more in tune, look past the words. As far as what I wish women would know with men, so it's kind of the flip side of that. <laughs> He can't read your mind. Yeah. He can't read your mind. And a lot of times men generally just don't know. There's a difference between the man who does, loves you, but does not know how you want to be loved. And the man who doesn't care about what you want and how you want to be loved. Mm -hmm. All right. Don't confuse the two. Some guys, uh, some guys not doing the right thing is d simply a lack of knowledge. And simply not a lack of caring. Exactly. So it's like I tell women, you got to be more specific. If you say, I need you to spend more time with me, what does that How look much like? Time? Exactly. What are we doing together? <laughs> exactly. Oh, I have this example where I was counseling this couple and the wife was like, he doesn't spend any time with me. I, I just want him to watch some TV with me, you know, whatever. So I said, okay, cool. I'm going to speak to your husband. We're going to get this worked out. So I spoke to him. He said, all right, deal. I'll do it. I said, let's do it for a week. Let's see what happens. So a week passes. I said, what's the progress report? He says, man, I did everything you told me. I watched TV with her every single day. I was there. You know, I showed interest. I asked her. I said, what happened? Oh, he didn't do anything. I said, what do you mean? He said he watched TV with you. She said, yeah, he watched TV with me, but he was on one side of the couch and I was oh on the other gosh. side of the couch. So you see, in his mind, it's you asked me to watch TV with you. I did that. In her mind, you asked me to cuddle you and exactly. caress you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. She wanted intimacy. She wanted desire to be shown. Mm -hmm. She wanted a closeness or, or non-sexual intimacy is what I call it. And that's what she was really looking for. So on one mm -hmm. end, I can go back to the man and say, listen, look past the words. Mm -hmm. If she says, I want time with you. It usually means she wants a closeness to you. Mm. She wants to feel there with you. So be mindful of that. But on her end, be more clear. Be more specific. It's not fair yeah. to hold it against him or to claim he doesn't care when you didn't explain to him what you need. I tell women all the time, one of the greatest tests to seeing if a man is serious about you is not seeing what he does on his own or what he already knows. It's seeing how he handles your desires and your feelings. Mm. If when you express those things to him, he makes the corrections, you're good. Yeah. But you got to be specific. You got to make it clear. Let's see if he actually does what you ask him to do. Because a man who's very much into you, he'll do it. Right. I know plenty of husbands or men who are like, if she would just tell me what she wants, I'd give it to her. Right. But he has no clue what she wants. Yeah, so communicate very clearly. Yes. Don't just expect them to read your mind. Exactly. I have a few questions for you left. This has been fascinating. This one is about uh, gender roles, with all the gender roles being redefined in society, at least in, let's say, you know, at least in our culture, I yeah. feel like it is, it seems that way. Uh, what are the best ways for men and women to create healthier roles in relationships with all this that seems like it's being redefined and figuring out and equality and you know role shifting or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So one, I am a I am a believer in roles. 
All right. Even if you want to dispel gender roles, we still need roles. Roles is what makes any unit thrive. A team needs roles. A uh, basketball team. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Corporations. You gotta have members. Gotta know their roles. That's how we're gonna get to the next level. If you have an entrepreneur and you got a team, yeah. they gotta know their roles. So roles are important. Now, once we start to slap gender on it, here's my thing. You need to look at this long term, not in the moment. And here's what I mean by that. So you have a lot of people arguing against gender roles. So let's say, well, a woman can do this, the man can do that. Okay, fine. If that's what makes you happy, go with it. I do believe that traditional roles are more beneficial in the long run, but let's start with the non-traditional ones right now. So let's just say as the woman, you're the uh, breadwinner of the household. You're kind of leading the household. To the right? woman or the woman saying this to the man? No, I'm saying, I'm saying let's just define that dynamic where the woman is more in the mass, in the more the traditional bread, masculine. He's the breadwinner. Yes, yeah. he's the breadwinner. She's, he's more the, uh, a house dad, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, stay-at-home dad. Yeah, this know. is just one Thank example. You, yeah. All right? Now, if you can picture yourself 20 years from now still happy in that dynamic, you got to be honest with yourself, then okay, cool. Roll with that. The problem that I'm coming across is they'll start off that way. And then 10 years later, you're mad because he's not doing more with his life. Mm. You're mad because he's not being more assertive. You're mad because he's not uh, walking in that traditional role of masculinity, so to speak. Now you're resenting him. You're losing respect for him. He's feeling like you don't treat him like a man. You don't respect him. He doesn't feel valued. Now, if they go cheat, I tell people this all the time, pay attention. If they go cheat. She always ends up cheating with a masculine man, and he ends up cheating with a woman that treats him like a king. Wow. Every single time. So that's my only argument. It's like, okay, fine. If you want to say we don't need traditional gender roles, cool. If that truly makes you happy, you can live with that, cool. But I need you to look at it from the long term. Because what's happening in a lot of situations is a lot of people are trying to switch the roles based on what's convenient for them right now. So, for example, if I'm the guy and I'm not doing well successfully, all right, and I don't have all my stuff in order, then of course I'm going to champion the reversal of roles yeah, yeah, because yeah. I need a woman who yeah. makes some money, Take who's going to accept yeah, me yeah. exactly as I am, who's not going to expect me to do all the manly things we're used to doing. It's about convenience. He's not really looking out for the interests of the woman. He's looking out for himself. On the flip side, you got a lot of women who champion this role of her being more of the masculine role because it's protection. It's control. All right? She feels safer, which is why one thing you're hearing from a lot of people right now is narcissism. Mm -hmm. All right? And everybody and their mama has dated a narcissist or is with a narcissist. But they don't realize that that dynamic feeds into narcissism. Because what happens is this woman now gets with this guy in a lot of situations, not always, because there are some genuine dynamics where maybe the guy is the house dad and she's aware and they're happy and everything's good and it's healthy. But you have a lot of situations where she's with him because she feels needed and valued in the relationship. He's with her because she he needs her. Yeah. All right. He she is her, his meal ticket, his come up. And now he's draining her. And taking and taking and taking. This is the narcissistic dynamic that happens, all right? And she's not happy. And at some point, this is going to all blow up in everyone's face. Or before it even, even she comes to that full realization, he'll get everything he needs, move on to someone else. Because mm. a man's desire for a woman can change based off his status. Wow. You see a lot of men who, when they're broke, have nothing, will date this one type of woman. Let them become successful, and now they're dating this completely different type of woman. And I always say it's because they always wanted that woman they wanted when they were successful. But it was easier to get that other woman when they wow. were broke. All right? So with that said, I encourage women to consider, is he really dating you at his best? And when I say at his best, um, I don't mean he has to be rich. All right? I don't mean he has to be super popular, super status, successful, yeah. any of that status stuff. But is his character developed? Mm. Is he a man who embraces responsibility? Is going to be willing to pour into the relationship? See, that kind of guy, whether he is the breadwinner, whether he is the house dad, is the guy you can respect and be in a relationship with. Right. Because that kind of guy, even if I'm not the breadwinner, I have the mentality of, I want to do for you. Mm. I want to take some burden off of your back. I want to have balance. I'm not going to just be here and leech off of you, mm -hmm. all right? Take, take, take. Exactly. But you have men who will just take, take, take in those dynamics and drain that woman dry and destroy her. 
So we have to be very careful. And again, going back to the original question, are you going to be happy with this, the current role you're setting yourself up for in the long run? Wow. And if you will be, cool. But if you won't, reconsider what you're about to walk into. Mm. So how do you make it work if you have very low compatibility, high connection and chemistry, but you are in complete different industries. You like complete different things. One person likes to be inside. The other person loves to go on long hikes. And you're just like butting heads about every activity and thing you want. Every movie, you don't like the other person's movies. Like, isn't that a strain on the relationship as well? Well, I, I would argue that when there's a connection, you're not going to butt heads. I feel like so when people don't have a connection and they're very opposite like that, you're going to have a lot of tension, a lot of butting of heads. All right. When there's a connection, there's a desire to want to share the moments you enjoy with you. There's a desire to, all right, you know what? I may not care for these types of movies, but I love seeing you happy and I want to be around you. So I'm going to try to learn to deal with some of these movies. We're much more willing to make sacrifices, be flexible, and, 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 and find a compromise when there is a connection there. And I feel like when there's a connection, we don't view the differences as a negative thing. We view it as, wow, they are, they're introducing me to a different world. They're showing me a different side. So, okay, maybe I don't like going out all the time, but now it's good that I have someone who likes to go out because she can pull me or he can pull me out the house more often, but I can also help them slow down a little bit and enjoy peace and being at home. There's a balance that's created that makes it a much more well-rounded relationship. So I think that it, what you'll find a lot of times in connection is that they're not the most, again, compatible based on society's perceptions of compatibility. People, they have these differences, but they make this full unit. It's like this yin to the yang type of deal. You know, it is doesn't it, have it, to be the same. Is it possible to find someone with extreme connection, extreme chemistry and 80% compatibility where it's like, wow, we like so many of the same things as well. Or are we just more attracted to kind of the opposite attract type of mentality, yin and yang type of balance? I think, I think it is possible to uh, have a strong level of compatibility. But I, if I'm honest, I do think there is some kind of balance that occurs within relationships with people who have connection. It's not completely down the line. We're just on the same page or like everything the same. I think there is a difference. And I think it kind of goes back to the fact that in nature, there's this polarity that has to occur. It's, it's the same reason why masculine is drawn to feminine, feminine drawn to masculine. You don't find a masculine person wanting another masculine person. All right. Now, when it comes to connection or real serious, healthy relationships, we desire the opposite energy that balances us out. So why, is, think, why is that? Is that just... Mother nature, human nature, why is that you think? I, and I can't say this is 100% accurate, but my belief is that, again, we are not created to be equal. We're created to balance each other out. We're created to come together and have this full unit. Why do my strengths need to be your strengths? How do we become better? If I am a business and I'm going to uh, acquire another company and merge with them, I'm not going to pick the company that does everything the same thing that I do as good. I'm going to pick the company who has a product or a service that's different than mine or that, that can enhance mine. But, and we come together and we're like Voltron and we become stronger together. So in having our differences, we are able to create a stronger whole unit rather that's than the exact same. Yeah, I think there was, a, I think a couple of years ago, Tyson Meat, the, the meat company, which is a big meat company, chicken and beef and all that stuff. I think they acquired like a couple hundred million dollars worth of Beyond Meat, which is a vegan mm -hmm. option. So it's like they are all meat consumption and they're like, oh, but this is something we don't have and it's growing in this space. Let's get on board and let's balance out in some ways. Exactly. So I see that as, a, a, as an interesting approach in relationships and an e interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious about sex on the first date and on the first night. We got this incredible explosion of chemistry. Like we've known each other for years. We were just, we, I can't believe we didn't connect sooner. Is sex on the first day of meeting something that can turn into a successful long-term relationship? Or have you just seen from your research and your experiences with the people you've coached that that's a recipe for disaster? 
It, it can definitely turn into a long-term relationship, marriage, successful relationship. I just think that we have to be careful with that mindset. So I remember one time, uh, I think it was an article I wrote and somebody commented and they said, you know, I've heard of plenty guys and not to make this only about how guys perceive it, but they had said, I've seen plenty guys not want to move forward with a woman who they had sex with on the first date. I've never seen a guy say, I can't make her my wife because she didn't have sex with me on the first date. You see what I'm saying? So it's like one approach is still safe. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't hurt you to wait. You're not going to lose anything by being patient before jumping into bed. If anything, you're going to increase your chances of making sure you know what you're getting yourself into. You're confirming there is a connection there. We're on the same page, so on and so forth. But if you move too fast and God forbid you're wrong, that you perceive this incorrectly, now you have possibly set yourself up for other issues. So again, can it happen? Yes. Especially if two people have a genuine connection, I do not believe that sex on the first date will derail them. Right. However, why not take the better, more likely approach for success or to be safe, better to be safe than sorry, and just wait. There's no need to rush for it. Yeah, I like that response where you said, You've never, what was it? You've never met a... Yeah, like, I won't make her my wife because she didn't have sex with me on the first date. But you've heard plenty of guys say, I don't take her serious because she had sex with me on the first date. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's interesting because when I met um, my girlfriend, Jeanette, we met online and we started talking, you know, just via messaging. And then it, a few weeks later, it turned into a FaceTime. And then it was a FaceTime every day for a few minutes. And then it was FaceTime every day for longer, you know, hours, two hours, three hours. And then we met about a month after we started connecting. I went into the meeting of like, I'm just going to go and be open to possibilities. Like who knows what this person is going to be like in person. I don't know. We've had an amazing connection on the phone where it seems like hours were minutes, that type of whole thing. You lose track of time. You, you can relate in certain ways with each other. And we're both inspired by one another. And then, we literally meet and within minutes we're kissing, you know, <laughs> meeting the first time we're kissing. And, but I also went into it with like, I'm not going to try anything sexual. Like if nothing happens, I'm okay. You know, I've seen each other for this weekend and you know, I just want to go and connect and I have zero intentions of trying anything further. I went into without that mindset. I was like, if I come home from this and we don't even kiss, like, okay, it was, it was an experiment. We we're magnets to each other. We started kissing within a few minutes. I kiss her and she was kind of thrown back, but liked it. And it was like, she didn't want to stop. And within minutes, I kid you not, within five minutes, she, she looks at me, she stops, she looks at me and she goes, you're mine forever. And I was like, you are a bold woman. I was like, uh, I just got off a plane to see her and she, and I go, wow, you're pretty forward. And she goes, do you want to go back on the plane? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, no, but I've never heard a woman say this within five minutes. Now, granted, we were talking for a month on, on yeah. the phone, but I've never heard a woman say this in five minutes. And if they would, I'd usually run like crazy and think she was crazy. But she was like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I just feel like my heart, my heart says this, and I feel like I just want to say it. And so I really respected her level of courage and vulnerability and honesty as well, where usually girls won't say that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this girl's got a lot of courage and she says what she feels. And it was just like, man, the chemistry was so strong. The connection was so strong all weekend and, and for the last, you know, over a year now yeah. that it, uh, it made, it didn't make logical sense. It made emotional sense. Exactly. And I think, I just kept going with it. And I was like, wow, okay, let's see where this goes. We'll take it day by day. But it's just like, it kept growing. And I think you should have some type of feeling of like instant connection because all the women I've dated in the past, I would say I've had instant connection with most of them, like with all of them, but it wasn't this type of connection. Like you said in the beginning, it's like this, something was different. I had maybe more like sexual attraction Yes. Then I was like, uh, you know, we're not connecting and vibing in the same way that I would love, but the sexual attraction is great and they got this and this. So it's like I'm justifying. Yeah. As opposed to this is what I what I want. And this is what it's like it's not even an option. This is what my heart is telling me I need to do. Yes. And I think if your heart is not saying, yeah, like pulling you to something, then it's probably a sign that that may not be the right fit for you right now. Absolutely. Now, 
do men and women approach early sex differently in your opinion beyond the, the first date beyond the one night stand type of thing do men and women approach it differently in the first months yeah i believe so i think it's more likely to find a man who is ready to go <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and has no no issues about when the sex occurs within that first month all right whereas there are going to be a lot more women who are concerned and and um genuinely are not comfortable yet you know the, the problem also is that just because sex occurs doesn't mean the woman was comfortable all right a lot of women allow themselves to get intimate but they weren't truly at peace with making that or allowing that to happen and so there's a lot more that goes on on her end regarding sex than it goes on on his end and i also believe that women are much more in their head about the situation than the man is the man is they're analyzing they, it they're analyzing oh what well, if i don't do this he's not gonna like me and blah, blah, blah. exactly exactly whereas i think the man's just excited he's enjoying the moment he's just getting it in but she's thinking, yeah, is this, gonna, is this too soon? Am I, is he going to like this? What am I, you know, whatever. She's just processing so much, which adds to her inability to even fully enjoy it a lot of times. But yeah, it, it's definitely different. We're, we're not wired the same when it comes yeah. to sex. We're just not. And do you think rebound relationships can work? Let's say you're in a relationship for six months, a year, a few years, 10 years, and you stayed in that relationship too long you stayed in it because it became hard to get out or it was good on paper whatever the reason is you stayed it you had kids whatever the reason is and then you get out and within six months you find someone and you're married six months later is that something that is possible to rebound into the next relationship and that can be your connection chemistry partner for long term or is that something, you know, should people wait two to four years until they fully heal and all this time and energy to get into it? What do you think? It's absolutely possible. One, we have to understand that healing is, is less about time and it's more about the specific work you put in. If you go through the process and you do all the steps, then you can achieve healing in months. All right. Um, people, people take years off and still never healed. So the time itself does nothing for you. Uh, with that said, the key is, has this new person genuinely surpassed how you felt about anyone else? See, I have a golden rule that you do not get in a new relationship if they have not surpassed whoever you had the strongest feelings for. They've got to pass that bar. What does that mean? So does that mean like the connection is so much stronger, the, you, the way you view them is higher, they yes. add more value to your life? Most importantly, it has to be the connection is stronger. That's most importantly. And so if you don't feel as strong as a connection, as strong as a desire, as strong as a, a draw to them, as you did whatever previous person, then you should not enter in that relationship. Because you, if you do, you will automatically have a void, a gap. Because it's, it's almost like you ate filet mignon and now you go have some spam. There's a huge <laughs> gap there, all right? You might be able to survive eating the spam, all right? Because it, it satisfies your hunger, but you know how much better meat can taste because you had the filet mignon. Yeah, you're not fully nourished. Exactly, and you'll never be fully satisfied because you had that better thing. So it's the same thing with relationships. If you've already experienced this higher level of connection, to go for anything beneath that, you will never be fulfilled and completely happy with it. You might survive for the first couple of years, but at some point the smoke's going to clear and you're going to be like, man, what, what am I doing here? Is this applied to any previous relationships, chemistry and connection or the previous one? I say any, they've got to surpass whoever held the highest position in your heart. Cause I, I, I strongly believe that the majority of people are not married to the person they have the strongest feelings for. Really? Right? Yes. And, and a, a, an even better test is ask yourself this. If you get with this new person and that person that you've had stronger feelings for comes back into your life, will you be okay? A lot of people, if that person came back and was like, I love you, I made some mistakes, I want you back, it, it's not that they will automatically leave their new relationship, but they will be torn and conflicted. It will Ooh. impact them. When you are really with the right person, that wouldn't phase you anymore. You'd be like, uh, please get out of here. I'm good. I'm, I'm doing amazing. I'm with the person I know is the one for me. 
But when they are the person you have the strongest feelings for when they come back, you're going to be rattled. So I'm hearing you say that it's not as much the time in between relationships. It's the work, the process of acknowledgement, healing, letting go, yes. where you could meet someone within a couple of weeks, depending on like if you were already unwinding in the previous relationship for a year yes. or two, you could find someone and be like, this can't, connection is just, you can't get us apart. And you could jump right in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Can self-love ever be a bad thing in relationships or too much self-love uh, in a relationship? I don't think self-love in its true form can ever be a bad thing. It's just that some people hide their arrogance and being self-absorbed with the label of self-love. What's the difference between self-love and self-absorption? All right, self-absorption is flat out being selfish. It's flat <laughs> out, who cares about how anyone else feels? It's all about you, 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 you. All right, there's no consideration of other individuals and you have no compromise in self-absorption. Self-absorption is it's my way or the highway. There's nothing else, it's no other <laughs> way around that. Self-love is simply the act of, again, pouring positive energy into you, um, being patient with yourself, you know, giving yourself what you need. It, it's, it's a lot of self-care, but it doesn't have the inability to be compromising. It doesn't have the inability to consider other people's feelings. You know, it's almost like, okay, I'm going to make sure I have what I need to eat, but I can give you some food if, if you're hurting. You know what I'm saying? Well, self-absorbed is forget you. This is all mine. Don't come near me. I got nothing for you. You know what I'm saying? It's very different. So to me, self-love, because love is pure. Love is a beautiful thing. And there's, there's no way real love, whether it be of self or of others, can ever be bad. But too many people use the label of love to disguise other toxic energies, behaviors, and, and perceptions. If someone is feeling down and out and they can't get out of a funk and they've followed the process of a lot of bad habits and decisions and thoughts and words and all these things that have kept them down. What are five of the most common self-love practices that you've seen or you've coached with women that you've seen elevate their relationship with themselves, increase their self-worth and get back on track? What are those five key kind of self-love practices? All right. So let me just say in advance that some of these will might be surprising to some people, but they really make a difference in self-love and getting yourself back on track. So number one is actually eating right. Mm. I remember I, I went to a counselor when I was um, back in my college days, um, and I remember the counselor telling me, listen, whenever you're going through something, the worst thing you can do is start to eat bad. That ice cream tastes so good, but then exactly. makes you feel so bad for the next 24 hours. Exactly. Because now if you're already depressed, oh. out, okay, for that moment that you're eating it, you may feel a little bit better. But the impact that the sugar is going to have on you, that crash you're going to feel, the way it weighs you down, makes you more sluggish, you're only compounding the issue. All right? So it's okay if you have a moment of eating whatever. But you, you, what your consistent diet needs to be is much healthier because that will give you more energy. It will affect your mood. It affects your hormone levels. These things are important. So being mindful of your eating habits and your overall diet is extremely important when it comes to self-love and, and breaking out of that funk. That's number, number one. I love that one. Number two is getting some damn sleep. All right. I was just going to say that. It's got to be sleep. <laughs> That's really what, I mean, so many people are sleep deprived and you know how hard it is to be positive and productive when you're tired and cranky? It's almost impossible. Exactly. Exactly. So getting a good night's rest, and that's the key. It's not just going to sleep, it's getting quality sleep. So you want to try to uh, turn off electronics like 30 minutes before you go to bed. You, you, you want to set an ambiance in your room that makes it more peaceful and easier for you to rest. You really want to clear your mind. You don't want to be stressing while you're sleeping because that happens, all right? You got a million things running through your mind. You never really had peace even in your sleep. So learning how to unwind properly before bed, having a set sleep schedule so you can get consistent hours of sleep 
days on, days out or whatever, um, this is going to be very important in helping you with your self-love and, and, and improving, you know, your overall quality of life, to be honest yeah. with you. Okay, number three? Number three is creating boundaries mm -hmm. in your life. So the problem a lot of times when we start to get down and out is that there are no boundaries, whether it be maybe with your kids, friends and family. So for example, let's say you're the person who's always helping everyone else. Now you're in this funk and you don't have anyone to turn to, but because you've established no boundaries, people keep trying to come to you and pull from you. And they don't stop to say, are you okay? Because they're used to you having it all together. They think you're always fine. So all they keep doing is taking, taking, taking. And if you don't set the boundary that says, listen, I'm not in a good place right now. I can't help you right now. I love you. You know I'm always there for you. But right now, I need time for me. You've got to set that boundary. And again, I don't care if it's kids, family, hell, sometimes even your own partner. Letting your partner know, hey, you know what? Just give me a day to get myself together. I'm going to, I got to process this. It's nothing about you. Just trust me. Let me do what I need to do. Sometimes we need that. So setting boundaries, being able to say no to people, that's huge in self-love. And again, don't confuse that with what I said earlier about being self-absorbed and selfish. It, when, when it's for self-preservation in the sense that you're drained and burnt out, it is necessary at that it's point. It's a must. Yep. Exactly. It's nothing selfish about it in that sense. You need it so you can recharge your batteries and then you can come back better than ever and you can help whoever you want to help. Absolutely. Okay. So these are all these so far, these three things are not the typical things that you'd hear women talk about self love, which is get a massage, get your nails done, go have some wine. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing some contradictions, which are inspiring for me, because I think these are the healthy ways to create self love. What's what's number four and five? So number four is I think, creating, basically doing things you enjoy. Mm -hmm. So now this is where we can get into the massages and, yep. and things of that nature. I do think there is a place for that in self-love and self-care because again, you got to put a smile on your face. Yeah. You got to create happiness within you. So whether that's again, going out to the park, going to a festival, whatever, I, I always suggest, again, you want to add structure to your life to where you make sure you're always making this a priority. So whether it's once a week, maybe once a month, whatever, there has to be, I'm going to do something for me, all right? Whatever that is. Even, and, and, and I will share this. Even for myself, I've had the hardest time doing something for me, like yeah. buying myself a gift or what do I like? And so, like, I now I'm going to make a budget and there's going to be money set aside for play money. This is to, for me. That's so it. Whatever you want to do. Bills, this is Exactly. Yeah. Don't worry okay. about investments. Don't worry about bills. This is just for me. Burn through it all. Burn through your money. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But and it I brings you enjoyment. It brings you fun. It brings you play. Those yes. things. And it takes pressure off of you. We're so bombarded by bills, responsibility. I got to do this. I got to be, be wise with this. Yo, be free. Just create. Again, and if you don't have the budget for that, create time for it. Yeah. But you need that time or budget or whatever where you can just be free and live your life. Mm, I love that. Just put a smile on your face. I love that. And what would you say is the fifth thing that we can do to increase our self-love? So for me, it's going to be about prayer and meditation. I feel like we overlook how much we are bombarded by in life. Um, and even something as simple as a morning routine, which would be perfect time to do prayer and meditation, would make a huge difference. Like I've noticed, um, and I remember even uh, Jim Quick, who you've had on your show before, yep. he mentioned about like, when you wake up, don't jump straight to the phone. Don't go straight to electronics. Take time in the morning to clear your mind, relax. So this is a great time to meditate, pray, stretch, all right? This can set the tone for the rest of your day. And again, it will help you elevate the energy in your body. It will help you be more positive. It will help you be more calm. It will eliminate all the, the brain fog you can experience when the minute you go, jump up, you got to go take care of kids or you got to run to the computer or you got to run to your phone. Stop all that. And if it requires waking up a little bit earlier so you can have 30 minutes of peaceful time, prayer, meditation to yourself in the morning, then do that. 
do it that. Is and, absolutely and, worth it. And go to bed a little earlier too if you need to get exactly. more sleep. You know, you want to make sure you get the right amount of sleep. Don't sacrifice sleep to do that. Just go to bed a little earlier. Exactly. Sacrifice that reality TV show. I sacrifice know. Sacrifice unnecessary conversations. Sacrifice browsing through comment sections on social media that aren't doing you any favors. Mm -hmm. Let that go. Preserve yourself. Go to sleep. Get your rest. Pray, meditate, all that good stuff. I love that, man. Is there a different way to love yourself versus loving your partner or loving others? No, I think it's all the same. Because again, the, the foundational principles of love, being patient, kind, uh, uh, loving, compassionate, all these different things, you need to give that to you just as you need to give that to your partner. Mm -hmm. Just as I want you to tap into your partner's needs, I want you to tap into your needs. You see, it's all the same. It makes no difference because love is love. It is consistent all the way around. So there is no difference in my eyes. When will you know if the relationship is over, even if you have this incredible connection or chemistry, but for whatever reason, you guys are, it's too much arguments, it's too much hurt, it's too much pain. When should you know that it's over? When one or both parties isn't willing to do the work necessary to fix it. So if we come to the table and discuss the issues and this person wants to be dismissive, deflect, and does not want to accept what needs to be done, relationship over. It doesn't mean things can't work out later, but there's no point in pushing through right now if that person is not willing to work with you. That doesn't make any sense. Or if you're not willing to put in the necessary work. So if, if we come to the table and say, we need to both go to therapy if we're going to make this work, and one or both of us is against it, then why are we still trying to have a relationship? Nothing's going to work here. We're going to drag this along, add more damage, to the relationship, add more damage to ourselves, and we're still gonna inevitably end in disaster. Better to cut the cord now, and if anyone ever has a revelation to where now they realize I'm ready to put in the work, we can have a discussion at that time. Wow. What's the greatest skill an individual can develop before getting into a relationship, and what's the greatest skill they could develop during a relationship to ensure they have a thriving, happy, healthy relationship? Effective communication. <laughs> and I, I stress the word effective because <laughs> people think, well, I talked to them. No, you screamed, you lashed out, you insulted them, you attacked. That's not effective communication. And effective communication is not just expressing yourself. It's learning how to listen learning how to process and receive what they're saying, learning how to put yourself, put yourself in their shoes. Too many times we reject what our partner says because we only want to look at it from our angle. We have to put ourselves in their shoes for a moment and feel what they're feeling. <laughs> I got a real question for you. Okay. What if their shoes are wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, even if their shoes are wrong, we have to understand why they, they chose those shoes. Well, like, how did we get here? Why are you seeing it this way? Yeah. So sometimes wrong is just a matter of perception, all right? <laughs> so for example, and I mentioned this on the last episode we had, where there was the guy, he had a girlfriend, they went to their, uh, his parents' house for a weekend, and uh, she, he didn't have any towels laid out for her when it was time to go to bed. And she blew up on him, because she said, you, you're never considerate of me. You never think of me. And he's like, well, damn, it's just a towel. Well, what's the problem? <laughs> okay? right. Now, in that moment, to him, she's being wrong. But she's wrong to him because your perception is it's about the towel. It's not about the towel. Listen to what she said. You never consider me. So now why do you feel like I never consider you? Now we can dig deeper into finding out. Now she may say, because when this happened, you did this. When this happened, you did that. And you might say, oh, now I see why she feels that way. Because we got away from the surface of the towel and we got into the deeper reasoning why she's in those shoes. All right? So that's what we have to do. It still takes effective loving communication from the woman <laughs> to bring it up and not attack as well and, and, and yes and that's 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 why i said that's the key you 
We have to learn how to express ourselves in a calm, loving manner. The minute you attack someone, they will defend themselves. And their ability to receive what you're saying or how you're feeling is completely diminished because now they're in defense mode. And now their brain is scattered thinking about how to, how to you know, get you off their back, so to speak. So if you come at them the right way, you speak calmly, lovingly. And again, even in you expressing your frustration, you have to put yourself in that other person's shoes as to why they're not seeing what you're saying right now. Mm-hmm. Because now when you understand they don't get it because of X, Y, Z, I can adjust the way I'm delivering this message, or I can give you an example that helps you understand it. Like me as a speaker, I believe one of the reasons why I'm successful is because I'm able to give analogies and examples that can connect with that person who may not understand this if I just spoke it in psychological terms or whatever the case may be. And so you have to learn how to bring the conversation to them, not just expecting them to take it as you want to give it. Of the people that you think are in a relationship for over a year, your estimate, Mm -hmm. what percentage of them uh, are really happy and have true connection? The people in a relationship for over a year, Mm -hmm. what's the percent of people that you think, let's say in America, that have true connection and are not just in it because of chemistry or maybe there's compatibility or desire for the first year or there's some whatever. The number that's coming to me is 20%. Wow. And I might be being generous. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I would argue the the vast majority, even past a year, are not truly happy and there's not a true connection. So you're telling telling me you believe that 80% of people that are in a relationship don't have real connection. Yeah. The why, uh, no, okay, here's one. One, why are we, why do people stay in relationships if they don't have connection? And two, if that many people are with the wrong people, if they all broke up, could they find the right person or would it maybe never find someone with real connection? Okay, so why we stay even when there's not a connection? One, because people don't even understand the concept of connection. Okay. So it's a very foreign thing to a lot of people. And what they've been taught by others is it's not about connection. It's about what well, you like them, they like you, and you get together and you see if you can make it work. Right? And, and because other relationships that are together without connection want to validate their relationship, they will encourage others who don't have connection to move forward in their relationship. All right? Because again, they don't want to face that fact. One a quick example. People are also afraid to be alone, I think. Oh, absolutely. Afraid to be alone, afraid to start over, afraid to be wrong, because especially in a situation where other people told you this wasn't it and you fought hard to defend oh. it, oh, you don't want to face that. There's also the, I don't want the other person to win. And I use that with yeah. a lot of women that happens. Whereas if there's another woman that's somewhere in the situation um, that he dated or maybe there was anything that happened, it becomes a competition. Oh my gosh. I'm not gonna let him go because I don't want her to win. Not wow. because I want this man or he's so amazing. That <laughs> seems exhausting. It, it's super exhausting, but there are a lot of women who engage in those kind of situations. Man, that's tough. Or f- have fallen into those types of situations. So oh, I think another one is, well, we've invested this much time, I don't wanna lose time. That is a huge one, really? especially for women. Women, and and it's everybody, but I do think it's even more so for women. Women have a very hard time walking away from anything they've invested a lot of energy, time, and emotion into. This is even for their careers. There are women right now listening to this who are not happy in their careers. They have not been happy for a long time. They may be successful. They may be doing very well, but they never felt at peace and at home there. But it is so hard to walk away when they gave so many years to it so much time and energy to it. They don't know how to just let it go. And so the same thing happens in their relationships. Yes, if they've invested so much time, even though they know he's not it, they know this relationship is not what it needs to be, they don't wanna walk away from that. So all of those things paralyze people and keep them in a situation where there's no connection. Yeah, I think I interrupted you. I'm not sure if you were to say something else, but I, I chimed in at one point, so. I can't remember. Yeah, no But worries. the second part was you said, uh, we, so you said, why do they stay when there's not a connection? Yes. Oh, and if they and were if, to break up. If, if 80% of these people said, you know what? We're breaking up because we don't have connection. 
Could they find someone with connection in the next couple of years or would they ever find that person? I think it's very possible. Can I say that it's yes for everybody? No, but I think for the most people, yes. I think what people don't realize is, again, there are a lot of people who, I know a woman, all right? Uh, she was a client many years ago. She, make a long story short, so she she married her guy knowing he wasn't it. She actually wanted to break up a few times before he proposed, Eesh. but found herself kind of feeling stuck. They didn't yeah, know how yeah. to reject it. She went through with it. Many years later, she meets a guy that she feels in a connection with that she never felt before. Ugh. Way more into this man than she ever was into her husband. But again, to the outside who doesn't understand this, they'll just say, oh, this woman lost interest or she's a horrible wife or whatever. But no, she always knew there was no connection with her husband. Right. She didn't even want to marry this guy. There are men and women who have gotten married knowing this is not the one. On their wedding days, they knew. Yes. I had another client who said their fam her whole family told her, if you want to stop, the they were at the wedding. They were in a room in the back. Said, if you want to stop the wedding right now, we will support you. Let's go. She said she walked out and walked down that aisle, got married. And she said, you know why she did it? Because she deserved to be married. Oh! N not because <laughs> that man was the oh. one. Not, not because there was a connection. That's no, the worst. No, because at that point, she felt like she deserved it. I'm, I'm 30. I'm this. I deserve My friends were all married. Exactly. Now I deserve it. Exactly. And, not, and oh, she, man. she can acknowledge that sick. right now. That would make me sick if I was that guy. And if I wanted to, if I love this woman very much, and I was giving my life to this woman, and she, in her heart, behind the scenes, 15 minutes before walking out, everyone's saying, walk away. We know this isn't the right for you. You know it's not right for you. And she goes, you know what? I deserve to be married. So I'm going to do it anyways, even if it's not right. Mm -hmm. That would, that's like so painful for the man, I feel like, too. Yeah, it's more painful being in a relationship where someone doesn't want to be with you than them breaking up with you, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I don't it, know. I mean... Then you're li living a lie as married. You're like, okay, this person really doesn't want to be with me for me. It, it, it's, it's, it's more hurtful because you're trapped in a situation where you're never going to get what you deserve and need. Oh, man. So at least if they break up with you, the breakup hurts, but you've been you've been set free. Free. And now you can get what you deserve. Free. But to stay there, and they don't really want to be with you, and if they don't really want to be with you, they're not going to pour into you the way that you need, uh. you're never going to have happiness and peace. So absolutely, it's much worse to be in that situation than to be broken up with. But I would say that a lot of men don't even realize what's going on in these situations. Uh, and what men have to realize is, listen, like I would argue in that scenario, He's not really in love with her. He's infatuated with her. And that's why he's willing to put up with things exactly. and do, tolerate things that exactly. he doesn't want to do. Exactly. To have this idea of her. Exactly. He's huh. infatuated. He's attached. Interesting. And so it, it, he views it as love, you know? And, and, and I'm not saying no situation is ever real love, but a lot of people get love mixed up, mm. you know? And, and again, to me, real love is a two-way thing, all right? And if, if we really love each other... Then, what well, I was going to say, we really love each other, we'd be able and willing to pour into each other. But unfortunately, this is where lack of healing comes in because that, that's what, like, there's some situations where two people can have a connection, can truly be in love. But if there's a lack of healing, it can still get thrown off. There's a lot of people who met their connection, but it did not happen because of fear. It did not happen because of a lack of healing. It did not happen because this was foreign to them. This was scary to them. It's very overwhelming to meet that person you have a connection with. It, it pulls out all your insecurities. Ooh. It makes you vulnerable in a way that you've never been vulnerable. And that is a lot. And so people will now run from their connection and go be with the person they're not really in love with <laughs> because it's safer there. Why? Why? If you find someone with this connection, this is a great match, would you sabotage it over and over again to go find someone who's not a match. Why do people do this? Because, so there's a few things to consider. One, the person you have a connection with has the power to hurt you like nobody else. Oh my god! So if your perspective, let's say you're a woman and you perceive all men as they're gonna hurt you, they're gonna do you wrong, right? They're gonna lie, they're gonna cheat, they can't be exactly. trusted. So now, I'm faced with guy A who is Mr. Perfect. He does everything right and I he, have an amazing connection with him. He pours into me love, yes. support, everything. Okay. And, and there's a connection there. But then I have guy B 
where it's not a connection there, but over here, I feel like I have one more value, all right? Because with perfect guy, I'm looking at him like this amazing man. How do I even deserve this? A lot of women have a struggle of wow. feel like they truly deserve this man or that they are truly good enough for this man. All right. They may not all verbalize it, but behind closed doors, that is a struggle for a lot of women. Also, it's the, the, the situation where, again, if you view men as they're going to hurt you, the guy, guy B, who's not good for you, is showing you the not good from the jump. So you know what's coming. Mm. All right. It's easier to deal with that than the perfect guy. And I say perfect in the sense of he's just an amazing guy. Then that guy we have the connection with where it's almost like you're waiting for the pin to drop and it still hasn't come yet. Oh. What the hell's going on here? It's, it's like too good to be true. Yeah, yeah. And you're waiting to get hit. There was literally an episode on divorce court one time <sighs> where this woman, she leaves this man. They asked the woman, why did you leave this man? What was the situation? She said he was perfect. He cooked, he cleaned, he was my best friend, he was an amazing partner. I said, so why did you leave him? Verbatim, this is what she said. I was just waiting for him to turn around and hit me. Now, everyone in the audience and even the judge didn't understand what was going on there. Oh, you're just ridiculous, you're a horrible woman. No, what she's saying is she is so conditioned to men being dysfunctional, hurtful, lying, cheating, whatever, that she could not believe wow. that this man was this good. And so now the fear of something has to happen drives you crazy. Good goodness. And so, so now what will happen is... Is this a non-healed woman? Absolutely. Yeah. So you will either run or you will try to sabotage because you've got to make something bad stick out. you got to validate your fear. Because you may not like it, but that's normal. Yes. It becomes normal for you. Yes. And whatever is not normal is unfamiliar and scary. Yes. Even if it's good for you. Yes. Even if it's peaceful and loving. Yeah. You've never had it. It's unfamiliar. So you're like, what's wrong? Exactly. And where, when the hell is something wrong going to happen? Something wrong has to happen. That's what I've been trained to believe. So now I can't take this insanity of waiting. Oh my gosh. That's what happens to a lot of people. <sighs> a lot of people. And I'm telling you, that's why. And, and let me give you another uh, Give it to angle. Me. Give it to me. So I've had a lot of uh, clients, women clients who have used the term, I felt like I was losing myself when dealing with a man that they had a connection with, all right? They, really? Yes, so here's the problem. If that woman has been hurt, all right, in all these situations she has been hurt, she has experienced some level of damage and trauma, she now becomes guarded, all right? That guardedness is her shield. Mm -hmm. It is her protection in her eyes, all right? But it also allows her to not be fully vulnerable, okay? So now she's operating under the, in this, under this shell, behind these walls. The man she has a connection with forces you to come out of that. So now you feel like you're losing yourself, but you're not losing yourself. You're losing who you've conditioned yourself to believe Ooh, you are my goodness. out of the need for protection. E. Even though it wasn't really protecting you, it was hurting you even more the whole time. Ooh. All right? So now... You're losing that ego part of yourself. Yes. The masks and, and the And guards. the safety of the guard, the safety of the walls. Wow. You, you're not allowed to have those walls with a con in a relationship that you have a connection. It demands greater of you. Oh. But the dysfunctional guy, the no good guy, the loser does not demand that of you. Wow. So you can continue to operate behind your walls, giving three quarters, half of your heart... All right, and validate it because you're with a guy who's beneath you, so to speak. What would you say are the three most important things that every man needs from their partner? Is it respect? What so, else? Support, respect, and I, I still got to use sexual, sexual satisfaction. Sexual satisfaction. Yeah. Support, sexual satisfaction. And respect. And respect are the three things that most men need in a relationship. Yeah. For because, them to feel happy and fulfilled. Yeah, because if you take away any of those three, it's a problem. If he doesn't feel respected, it's going to cause huge problems. He doesn't feel supported. A lot of people don't realize a lot of infidelity does not start from um, that man having a sexual desire for another woman. It can start from a lack of support in the household. And then you have other women coming around who are, you know, feeding his, his head with you. I think you're amazing. If you were my man, I would do this and blah, 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 blah. I believe in you. And he doesn't get that at home. And that opens the door to it becoming sexual, uh -huh. which is why you'll see a lot of situations where 
the man cheats on his partner with a woman who doesn't even look as good as his partner. No. But it's fulfilling some sexual need. Not, not even a sexual need. It fulfilled first the emotional need. And then, yes, and it could be just sexual depending on what the initial mm -hmm. issue was. But, yes. yes, it can go. It can either be sexual or emotional. But I think people always think it's a sexual thing with An me. emotional need meaning, like, I'm not getting the respect I want, so that's an emotional feeling. Yes. Or not feeling supported at home, so that's an emotional yes. feeling. Yes. Yes. So the three things that every man you believe needs, most men need, is respect, support, and sexual satisfaction. satisfaction. Yeah. What would be the three things that every woman needs from their man to feel fulfilled? I, I want to say love. And I guess when I say the word love, I mean it from the standpoint of non-sexual intimacy, being able to pour into her emotionally, mentally, being able to hold her, caress her, it's everything other than sex. And again, it's not to say that women don't enjoy sex or don't desire or need sex, but if you just gave them sex and you didn't give them those other things, it's going to be a problem. Yes. Love. So, yep. so I think love, I think security. Again, it goes back to that needing to feel safe, needing to feel comfortable around you, needing to not feel judged around you. Um, I think that's extremely important. Again, you, you take away a woman's security. I want to give one quick example. I had one client where... Um, she was with a guy, and while they were in a relationship, she never had an orgasm with him, okay? They get married, and it's orgasm city. Really? Yes. <laughs> it, just, it just starts flowing out, oh. okay? Yes. Now, Boom. Now she feels fully safe. Or you know. Yes. But then here's what happened. Years in, he was in the military. He cheats on her. The orgasm stopped. Mm. And I always use that to say, listen, nothing changed sexually as far as physically what was happening. But mentally and emotionally, yeah. she no longer felt safe and secure in this relationship. And that was enough to turn the switch on and off when it came to her sexual satisfaction and her being sexually receptive to him. Yes. So definitely security is the other thing. Um, and I, I think I'm trying to find the right word, right way to phrase this, but I feel like the word that I want to use is stimulation. I feel that women need to be stimulated by their man. Now, that could be mental stimulation. That could just be spontaneous fun in the relationship. Just not being boring. Like, women can get very bored easily in a relationship. You have to find a way to keep her stimulated. Again, and, and, and I don't want men to hear that and think I'm constantly doing... No, but... There has to be enough in your bag that you can pull out when necessary mm -hmm. or that certain things you possess naturally that keep her in that place. Because once she gets too bored, that opens the doors to problems as well. Is it harder for a man to provide these keys for a woman to feel satisfied or is it harder for a woman to show up and give what the man needs to be satisfied. So my honest answer, my initial, what I want to say is it's harder for the man. Because men, it's hard, it's in general, it's hard for a driven masculine man to really take a moment to be non-sexual and intimate in an affectionate, listening, compassionate, generous way and to think about how can I be spontaneous and fun and interesting um, when I'm just focused and driven to go provide and bring back. Yeah. It's harder, right? Yeah. So basically you can look at it as you've got to really be able to tap into oh your feminine side, so to speak. As a man. To be, yeah, as a man to be able to tap into her needs and desires, Gosh. whereas... She doesn't necessarily have to tap into her masculine side to satisfy us. No. Other than you could argue maybe when it comes to her approach to sex. If she approached it from a more masculine, like, I'm just ready to go, then, yeah, I'm, a lot of guys would be happy with that. But, but she can remain in her feminine. Yeah. And respect you and support you. Exactly. And Interesting. It's, so it's easy, it will be easier from her, for her from that standpoint. So it's really like men need to really learn how to be masters of themselves and yes. become master of flexing both the masculine energy and the feminine energy to be able to fully pour into their partner, their yes. woman, at a high level the way she needs to receive it. Absolutely. And that means you can't just be the, the big, strong, tough, pr driven provider. You've got to have some sensitive vulnerability within you to be what it sounds like the ultimate masculine man. Yes. Right? Absolutely. 
that's definitely it's all about the balance from within us and and we've got to we got to get more comfortable with it we've got we got to get more educated on how we go about it you know because i i want men to understand that though i i'm encouraging them to tap into their feminine side to be able to provide some of these things you don't want to lose sight of your masculine and so that's why it's it's still important like i i call it loving in your masculine all right mm -hmm. you have to learn how to love in your masculine and that might sound tricky but i do believe it's extremely possible once you grasp the concept and you start to become comfortable with it because Consider yourself. Now you're at a point where you had the confidence to say what you want, to lay everything out. You remove the fear of, well, if, if she doesn't like this, I'm going to lose her. No, you know what it needs to be. Either you're with it or you're not. So now that allows you to remain in your masculine while you still can provide for her in the ways that she needs. Right. You see? We, we slide fully into the feminine when we become this, oh my gosh, I have to keep her, I got to do everything to get her, whatever, whatever. We become emotionally needy. Now it's like you're trying to do everything she wants, but you don't have that balance of standing strong in who you are. And that's really all it takes in my opinion. That's why it's so important to have these conversations up front before you enter the relationship so that you're comfortable walking away or losing someone as opposed to just giving in to try to keep them, yes. right? Never be afraid to lose them more than you're afraid to lose yourself. Oh, dang. You know what I'm saying? That's good, man. <laughs> it's so true, though. Yeah. Why do you think so many people are afraid to lose someone else and they'll give in at any moment because they don't want to lose someone? Well, you can't be afraid to lose yourself when you don't know who you are. Mm, it's true. You see? You you know what's in front of you with them or what you believe you is in front of you with them. see something you're like, I want that. Exactly but you haven't done the work within yourself to understand that this is not who you are right now, that this is compromising what you need, that this is undermining what's gonna allow you to be happy in the long run. Once you find that place, find that person within you, and you embrace mm -hmm. it and you're confident, now you can't be moved from that. And now you're gonna approach situations and relationships completely different. And again, that confidence and understanding of self alone is gonna exude a certain energy that people will respect and make you more desirable in people's eyes. And you'll be able to see what you don't want. You yes. know, the wounds that someone else is carrying with them that you're like, I don't need to go rescue this person. They gotta heal first. Exactly. Before they can enter in my space if I wanna create a conscious, healthy relationship. Absolutely. Right, because why do you think so many men or so many women attract uh, a partner with so many wounds or that is wounded and needs them to rescue them? Well, I, I think I always tell people, you know, some will say you are what you attract. And I dispute it because I feel like you can be the most healthy individual. There's still going to be unhealthy people or people who still need to heal coming your way. Yes. That's normal. That's life. You're going to attract everyone. Exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> everyone wants to be a part of your light. The key is who you entertain. So if you keep entertaining these people mm -hmm. who need healing, who have these issues, then that speaks to issues within you that have not been resolved. Right. And those things are feeding your need to either, again, feel like, well, if I can fix them, I have more value here. I have more control here. All the things we talked about earlier on in the conversation, that's what's playing out when you feel like you want to hold on to this individual. Or, again, you don't know yourself enough to understand that this, what you're doing right now, you can't even sustain it. And you will not be happy with this relationship. Even Like, people don't realize if they got this person they wanted so bad, they're going to be more miserable after the fact. Really? Yes. Because, again, they're so blinded in the moment of I want them, I want them, I want them. They're not even considering what I have to do to oh even get gosh. them back and what I'm going to have to do to keep them happy as well as you're probably setting the stage where they're going to get to say, oh, well, you have to work to have me. I don't have to work to have you because you're starting off unbalanced. So why would they all of a sudden say, OK, well, let me switch it off. And now let me do more for you than you were doing for me. No. Part of the reason they even got with you is because you were comp overcompensating for what they weren't giving you. Right. So you're you're going to end up miserable anyway. Mm. But if you healed and you did your own work, you would not go far, that far down the path. So it goes back to one, creating balance in a relationship, not equality. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and I want people to understand when I say not equality, again, I think that the man and the woman have equal value to the success of the relationship. I can't do this without you. You can't do this without me. 
But we have different roles. We have different roles. Uh-huh. Look at it like on a basketball team. Yeah. Think about the Bulls when it was Robin, Pippen, and Jordan. Robin can't do what Jordan and Pippen can do. No. You could argue that he is not, quote unquote, as equal in value to them, right? But they cannot win the championship without him. He is the missing piece to the puzzle. Mm-hmm. So to me, I don't like this idea of finding your equal. No, find your missing piece. Mm. Who completes your puzzle? Who complements you? They don't have to bring the exact things you bring to the table. Right. They don't have to have quote unquote equal value. No, they just have to be the complement that when you guys come together, you make a whole unit that's unstoppable. Mm-hmm. What happens when uh, two healthy, conscious, whole people come together and they're in a, a powerful match for one another, mm-hmm. what happens for those individuals in life? I just think everything gets better from there. Like now you just have a place of peace, a place of understanding. You you have a place where you can get re-energized and, and take on life a lot more. I think you can accomplish more. I just think that two people coming together at that magnitude, it magnifies everything in both of them, all the good in both of them Mm -hmm. and whatever they were doing now they're going to be able to do better later yeah so it's just it's an amazing thing when it happens have you ever seen a man never get in a committed long-term relationship uh live a healthy uh, live a healthy happy life long term being with multiple women for the rest of their life no (laughs) i I haven't seen it you know i think i think at some point Every man who has lived that life says to themselves, I really don't want to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. This is too much. It's exhausting. Dealing with these different women, it's very unstable. It can be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Um, Who knows what drama may come with it. I think that there's a desire to just have one, but for some, what's stopping them isn't a lack of desire. It's the fear of giving themselves fully to one woman. Why are they so afraid? Well, because they've been hurt before. Most guys Mm -hmm. who live that life have been hurt before. You'll you'll see situations where a man could even grow up being a player. Maybe he had uncles, cousins that all said, have your fun, do your thing. And no matter how much he's been programmed and trained to be a player, he will meet a woman at some point that he's willing to throw in his player card for. He's like, forget it, I only want her. The problem is men are not taught how to handle handle when they feel that way about a woman. They don't understand how to go about it, so they mishandle the situation. People get hurt, things mm-hmm. go left, and now when everything blows up, he he's resenting he's resenting love. He's resenting maybe that woman. He now shuts down and to him the solution is I'm not going to give my heart to one woman again. Right. So multiple women is a coping mechanism for him. Because I don't want to deal with the stress or the feeling trapped or the pain or whatever. No, I, I don't want people to feel, uh, deal with the vulnerability of it. Ah, interesting. You see what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there aren't men who... Oh, I'll say this. I think even the men who desire to sleep with multiple women would prefer to have that one woman and then do their thing on the side. Right. You see? So they still want that one individual that they can rely upon even when they have a desire to, to sleep with others. So to me, I, I just don't see a man wanting to never have that one woman and just say, no, I'll just keep being with a bunch of different women. Right, right. It's mm-hmm. draining him. They want to have at least a partner they feel supported, respected. Yes. Um, but what I've heard, what I'm hearing you say is you don't think that works long term, of a man having one woman and then having women on the side. No, because it's 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 you're inviting a lot of potential drama. Yeah, it's hard parasite to parasite energy. Yes, it's it's hard to be emotionally available for all. Listen, it's hard enough to be emotionally available for one woman, depending <laughs> on the type of guy you are. Okay, all right. So now you got to manage multiple women. Mm-hmm. That's just really tough. I think, like even when you t- think about back in the days, and I'm in way back in the days, kings and queens, and you had kings with many women. That was more for reproduction, right? It was and, like we need to. Yeah, p- part of his status, reproduction. Some of it was, well, these women, if they didn't, if they didn't allow themselves to be married to this man or be one of his wives, they'd be out in the street and homeless. But here's the thing, like, yeah, he might have been cool because he's king, but these women weren't happy. 
Mm. They just accepted it. It was it was acceptable enough to work with, but it wasn't what they really wanted and desired. Right. So it's never this unit of two people who are just so happy in it. And I would still argue that that king, if he doesn't have a queen, no matter how many concubines he has, if he doesn't have a queen, he still feels empty. Mm -hmm. He still needs that one woman that he can share his life with. Wow. So wanting to sleep with multiple women is very different than the need to have that one woman that you can share life with. What is your thoughts, uh, going back to submissive, this word that women, <laughs> some women don't really like, uh, right? Yeah, right? What would be another word to be used for submissive that you think women might be receptive to hearing and be like, okay, I'm going to take listen to this perspective? My, I was going to say let your guard down, but no, that's not going to work either. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that one either. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I is don't it more, know. Is it feminine? Is it, what's the word like? Well, I, th I think, again, depending on the woman's perception of what these things mean and what they, or what they mean to her specifically, will dictate how receptive she is to each word. And that's why I think at some point, I, I, rather than trying to find a different word, I just want them to understand that submissive is not a bad thing. Mm. I'm not saying submit to every single man that comes your way. But if you're with the right man, if you are confident this man is a good man, is pouring into you, is showing up the way that he needs to, why, why not embrace it? Allow him to lead in certain ways. Yes, and, but, you know. but what I think women have to understand is because I, I guarantee you there will be some women who just heard that and say, well, I have no problem with that. If he shows himself worthy, I will submit. I think the disconnect is, but you're not exuding an energy outside of that, that says you're a woman who's capable of that. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So it's like, yes, I do believe that most women in the presence of a masculine man who loves them and they feel safe around is going to let their walls down and quote unquote submit. Naturally, it'll just happen. They won't even think about it. It will just naturally happen. But when she's out and about, when she's at a party, whatever the case may be, She's not giving off that energy. So that man who's capable of pouring into her in that way doesn't even step to her. He goes to somebody else. Right. And so I just want women to learn how to exude that energy mm. more. But that doesn't mean you're submitting to every single guy that comes your way. Sure, sure. We mentioned that about this before. I've been seeing a lot of content on TikTok about some women saying that, you know, once you hit past 30, Mm. Your value as a woman has gone down dramatically for, uh, you know, a driven, high desirable man. Yeah. Is there truth to that? Or what do you think about this for women over 30 who aren't married, who don't have kids? Um, are they as desirable as a great partner for men in their 30s and 40s? Or are those men that are now emotionally ready to commit more interested in someone younger yeah. than them? I think... So I'm going to put it to you like this. I think people have to understand there's a difference between what we put down on paper that we want versus what happens in the reality of life. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yes, if you ask a highly successful man, uh, would you prefer an over 30 year old woman versus a woman in her 20s? Majority of them are probably going to pick in her 20s, though. There are going to be men who will say in over 30. And that's the thing I want women to understand. Not all of these men think the exact same. They have different reasons. I've met men who were very successful who did not want to date a woman under 30, refused to they, date a woman under 30. Because they probably thought it'd be more drama or less emotional exactly. availability or whatever it might exactly. be. Exactly. There's a trade-off somewhere less and they didn't want to make that trade-off. And it's like, yes. what do we have in common? Exactly. And depending on what that specific man truly values will determine which side he falls on. But what I want people to understand is, again... Even if, even if we said 90% of those men want under 20 on paper. Under 30. Under 30, I'm sorry. Yeah. Under 30. Yeah, under 20 bad. might be. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> take that out. No. <laughs> we got to keep it above. But okay. Under, under 30. 30. Yeah. Then what happens is um, in real life, though, if that successful man goes to a bar, meets this beautiful woman exuding all this feminine energy, they talk. The conversation is amazing. They're, they're, they're in full alignment with what they want and what they like. He's not going to say, oh, you're 31? I can't talk to you anymore. Mm -hmm. At that point, it doesn't matter. Once the vibe is there, the connection is there, it doesn't matter. So you have tons of people that end up with someone who didn't fit what they would have wrote down on a piece of paper. 
You see, because what we write down is like our most ideal based off our logic. So it's almost like if you ask someone what kind of car you want, they might mention, yeah, I, I want a Bentley. But when they leave the dealership, they left with a Corolla or, or you know, a <laughs> Nissan or right, whatever right. the case may be. Because they realized that's what worked better for them by the time they were done. So I just think that people get caught up in what they're hearing on the internet rather than, listen, if you show up as your best self, you can still win. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s, yeah. 40s, 50s, whatever. It doesn't matter. You just have to be your best self. And, I, and what I also want women to understand is your goal is not to appeal to the whole base of men. Your goal is to find that one man who, man who aligns with you. So even if 90% of the guys say on paper they don't want this, well, maybe your guy's in that 10% and you'll be fine. Just focus on being your best right, you. Right. You know, everyone has different degrees of self-determination. And so in a relationship, when you've fallen in love and you really care about somebody and they're asking you to do something or be something, that could be a, a very compelling thing to do even when it's not who you are. And so the fear of, if I don't, will they leave?